It's that time of the week. Yes, this week's cult movie show. Your weekly look at cult movies. Please welcome your hosts, Warren and Velvet. Yes, it is that time of the week again. Uh, the cult. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> So excited. <laughs> and uh, it is. Warren, why do you tell everybody you're in Australia? Why do you say you're in Melbourne when everybody knows you're in Jersey? So I'm in yeah. Jersey. That's right. I'm really in Jersey. Uh, it is a podcast 31. I've got to hope it's 31. I can't remember anymore. Um, of the cult movie know show. Anymore. Um, <laughs> I am, of course, Warren. Sitting with me virtually in the studio is, of course, Velvet. How are you, Velvet? Oh, I am in a ridiculously, wonderfully good mood tonight. So we have the most amazing show ever. So first off, we have a crazy mini movie that we're going to be reviewing later. We have a straight up martial arts cult classic. Just me saying that you can probably already guess what it is. And we even have an unofficial. I, I can't wait. To I can't wait to classic. hear all about it. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a. It's guest better than tonight. the play. <laughs> <laughs> we have a guest tonight, as you can see. He's a, this is our friend of the show, and also we're silently starstruck. That's why we're laughing so much, because he's so entertaining. This is Ethan Martin, and we reviewed his independent film, Eyes of the Roshi, that he also has a starring role in, and he blew our fucking minds, and now we're just going to bust a gut laughing with him. So and welcome to the show, Ethan. you had me on. I can't believe it. You saw the movie, and yet you still want me on your show. Yes, we're just <laughs> crazy right. here. Right. We're absolutely crazy here, but it is an honor. It is an absolute yes. honor to have you uh uh to to have you on the show so an official welcome well thank you thank you both by the way i, I have to ask how are the hills and dales of montana it is an unusually warm night in the mountains of Montana. The local Bigfoot are actually running around naked now. It is their yearly shearling when it gets really hot. It usually happens around June, but we're having unusually hot weather. So there's actually, it looks like there's naked men running around, but it's actually the local Bigfoot because they're like seven feet tall and they're humongous. And there's just like these big piles of fur, kind of like leaves. But it's so you have fur, shedding, so. you have shedding yeti <laughs> all over the place. Yes, they're not That's interesting. Yes. I, it's it's quite the sight. It's quite the sight. They're not I spreading no plague by any chance. <laughs> no, no, I hope not. No. <laughs> not when they shave all the fur, fur off. <laughs> All right. Well. You never know what's in the fur. Don't touch it. <laughs> don't jump into it like a pile of leaves. Just leave it alone. Oh, just leave it alone. Walk away. Don't just, just don't, leave it alone. Don't, don't poke it with a stick. Just 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 <laughs> keep walking. Keep walking. So, That's right. <laughs> but look, look, first, the first... No, not the flashbulb, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. The Yeti get very nervous when they see the flashbulb. It's <laughs> when they're like furless, like naked sheep style, like you know, the sheep. I mean. Oh, not yes. when we take I, pictures of them when they're shedding. Yeah, no, sure. it's, but, don't blame them, I and I don't know why you're trying to peep at the private parts of a Yeti anyway. <laughs> I'm walking outside my window. What are you, window, paparazzi? Swinging it around like a helicopter. I mean, how can I not look? That's a pretty fascinating sight, you know, nature in action here. Well, there's, there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's a new documentary, The Set's Life of the Yeti. Oh, gross. Oh, God. Ew, I to. No, I don't see that ever. No, no, no it's okay. That. It's 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 National Geographic. It's okay. Yes. <laughs> national pornographic. Oh, no, thank you. No, thank you. I think oh. we're we're straying just a little bit, just a little bit. Kind of a tradition on this show right. to stray. We're leaving Montana. We're coming back to New Jersey. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Um, but so, but look, we obviously, obviously want to talk about uh, this amazing, you know, film um, Eyes of the uh, Eyes of the Roshi, and uh, it's, I mean. I suppose, Ethan, just for anyone who hasn't sort of seen it yet, I know that obviously we reviewed it. Uh, when was it? It was a couple of months ago now, I think, Velvet, if, if if that was right. Yeah, it's been a couple of months, and it's one of those movies that it's still a movie I think about, and I just I can't wait for it to come out in, like, wide syndication when we can actually finally download it, buy the DVD, see it in theaters, because it's just such an original piece of storytelling. You can hear the review of Eyes of the Roshi on Podcast 21, 
our Eric Roberts special, actually. <laughs> but yeah, we we love this movie. It's. Um, I, I mean, I have to um, sort you of have ask discriminating taste. <laughs> I, ha- I, I have to. I have to ask. Where did the whole idea behind the movie sort of come from? Was there? Was this just something that was created, or was there anything sort of real which had influenced um, this story? Yes, and yes. Uh, first and foremost. Oh. Uh, Grandmaster Adam had his own life story. Uh, you know, he came over from Vietnam in, I believe, 71, uh, before the fall mm-hmm. of Saigon. And he had been teaching since he was about eight or nine years old. This will be his, I think, he's heading for his 50th anniversary of teaching. So, I guess at 14, he officially, his, his Grandmaster... Uh, let him start teaching classes. Wow. So he, he had uh, he had come over, and I think he was enamored of Western culture when he was growing okay. up. You know, his favorite shows were Batman and you know Hawaii Five O and anything American was culturally cool. Mm-hmm. And uh, Western music, so everything from you know the uh, Ventures to the British Invasion, and then the Beach Boys, but certainly almost anything American was really cool. Mm -hmm. So cinema was a great part of his life growing up. So even though he was a grandmaster, he also became, uh, you know, really good uh, at guitar and all facets of music. And he got his master's degree in business economics. He's a fascinatingly well-rounded guy. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. He, he wanted to get into films, and my family had built a movie studio here in Virginia, and for years he'd say, you know, do, do a movie about me. Do a movie about me. <laughs> That's the way to like, do it, yeah. Like, well, Adam, you know, I, I've got projects I'm working on, but uh, one day he really was serious, and I was in a meeting uh, with him. I was – I thought I was called to the meeting to pitch one of my story ideas. Uh, I was with another uh, – producing partner at the time who was working on this project with me, but he ended up wanting to pitch two of his own ideas. And so the one we were working on together, uh, which made me laugh. And then Adam clearly uh, came to the meeting, not caring. He had his own idea. He wanted to pitch. (laughs) So he had uh, one, one of the people who became our associate producer, Mary Mann with him. And she had written his book, and she'd written a really uh, beautiful, sensitive book uh, about his journey. And he kind of rewrote what she wrote and added all these fights. And he's 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 he's, he's, it's incredible because he's this peace loving Buddhist. But man, when it came to the film, you know, no, no, we need some fights, and we need these characters, and you know. And so he handed me, because I was the one actor around the table, and he said, here, re- read, read a couple of pages. So he hands me this mess, which is, uh, you know, <laughs> single, single spaced, you know, oh, 80, no. 80, 80 pica wide, just crazy. <laughs> oh, my God. And not quite, not quite legible. And I'm looking at Mary, uh, man, who's near tears because she's, you know, looking at was once her beautiful book and it's just this pile of mess. And I'm reading it and I'm editing as I'm reading and I'm playing four or five or six different characters at the same time. (laughs) You know, and my brother Richard, who uh, was one of the executive producers on Roshi, he was there too. And as I'm going through this, uh, for lack of a better word, script, uh, You know, they're flipping through the pages going, where is he getting this from? So, I mean, I'm editing and making it up as I go along because what I'm reading is unintelligible. And, you know, Adam is like, see, is that great? (laughs) And my brother's (laughs) like, what the hell? (laughs) And and Mary's like, how did you do that? So uh, out of that meeting, I told Adam, you don't have a screenplay here. And if you really want to do this seriously, we, we have to write one. So. Eventually, mm-hmm. Eyes of the Roshi uh, evolved from that. I actually was meeting uh, Mary earlier today, and I said, you know, you've got to get me your original book because that should be published. But that's mm-hmm. how Roshi first 
started. I told That's Adam cool. I'd get him I'd get him a budget and uh, if he was serious, we'd move forward. And if not, I love him anyway. And we move <laughs> forward. Well the, the the end product was just absolutely amazing. I mean I I, I have. I, I must be honest. When I went in, when I watched it for the first time, I really, really didn't know what to expect. I went in with it, sort of with with no background whatsoever. And when mm-hmm. the movie had finished, I was just sort of in awe. I, I mean, I loved the uh, the characters. Um, the I, I love the way that there is this use of very serious drama and emotion. But at the same time, there is this amazing use of humour. Um, it, it is. It was just a wonderful piece of work. <clears throat> well, thank and you. It had the same thank effect you. on me. <laughs> it had the same effect on me. I, um, when we originally reviewed this, like I said, this was a movie that I really had to sit and think about, which is, you know, if a movie actually makes you think, that's, you know, really good piece of storytelling. But, okay, we're not going to spoil the ending of the movie, but I have to ask you, okay, the ending of this movie, was that yes. purely imp- was was that- improvised was that purely scripted did you guys do several different takes and pick the best one i mean how did you come up with that ending uh, there were several different endings written mm-hmm. and as we got closer and closer uh you know we kept rewriting and honing and saying nah in one of the endings uh the ingenue bit it uh huh. We took her out. Uh huh. And wow, you know, uh, the grandmaster was going to walk off into the sunset carrying her lifeless body, and that's mm-hmm. how it was going to end. Wow. And uh, we just thought, all right, well, that's too much. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. No, um, I agree. That would have been a totally different movie. Um, yeah, like I said, we don't want to spoil the ending, but I absolutely love the way yeah, and I, and I, this movie. And I, and I won't give away the ending, but suffice to say, uh, we shot a different ending, mm-hmm. and we just decided, nah. So we went right back to the <laughs> drawing board, and I sat down with my director, and uh, you know, we rewrote, we rewrote the ending. Well, the, <laughs> the, the thing I, I loved about that was that with – with the, the characters in the movie, there are good question. By the, the way, yeah, oh, <laughs> thank most you. definitely. You're welcome. With, with Sorry, the, uh, Warren, you, you may speak. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, you um, may speak, like, Warren. Like, yeah, sorry, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. Um, the um, oh, you are <laughs> the <Play>. um, <laughs> release the rabbit. No, um, the the, the um the. Uh, with with the various characters, I mean, you've got people who are genuinely good, good at heart, and you've got other people, whether not necessarily by their own fault, but they're to a degree evil at heart. Um, and mm-hmm. the thing I love about this movie is that karma plays such a role, uh, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. w- with these characters. Uh, what you reap, you will sow. And that is the thing I loved about it. There's no... Uh, and, and for all the characters, it's not just for some of them, it's for all of them. And that was something I, I really took from the movie. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, Grandmaster has a line in the movie. Uh, Fate is the consequence of action. Hmm. So yeah. You, yeah. Reap, you reap what you yeah. sow. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, you didn't um, expect me to be serious, did no, you? No, no, I yeah, know. It's, that, 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 it's like, <laughs> wait a minute, what's the punchline? <laughs> the punchline. Um, I also love about this movie is there's so many characters, and I actually care about all of them, which is so hard to pull off in movies. So many movies have it, you know, so little, or they're just not rounded, they're not filled out enough that you don't care if they get shot in the head. You don't care if they in the movie. And in this one, you, you're, you're, you don't care you're if they get a splinter. <laughs> yeah <laughs> and it, it's true and in this one you're like anytime somebody gets killed you're surprised you're like oh didn't see that coming oh well i guess they're not going to be in the end of the movie oh they're not going to make it like yeah like no matter how many Look, characters are introduced you're like you care about what happens to everybody in this movie i appreciate you saying that uh, you know there was a depth that of good acting that i don't think you find in a lot of indie films i mean 
there were a lot of really uh, superb and superior actors in this film. I mean, Eric Roberts goes without saying, but right. you've got a lot of unknown people who, uh, as this film sells and gets known and continues to build its cult following, you've got a lot of people who I think are going to come out of this film uh, mm-hmm. and people are going to trace them back to this film and go, ah, can you believe they were all in this film together? So right. I'm really, I'm really looking forward to a lot of the uh, actors who are in this film getting discovered as a result of this film. Yeah, we were really surprised by how charismatic Grandmaster Adam was because this is not somebody who's been formula- formally trained as an actor, has a lot of acting experience, and he has a leading role. And he's charismatic. You like him. You want to hear what he says. You want him to make it to the end of the movie. <laughs> Does he make it to the end of the movie? No, people, you have to see the movie when it comes out. So, That's right. <laughs> when, is this move- when is this movie coming out, Ethan? When can other people? Well, uh, literally, we had our premiere on uh, Friday the 13th of this year, uh, 2017. So it's officially out. But when it gets uh, distribution, uh, you'll know because uh, Sam Sherman of Independent International Pictures Corp., will call me and say, we have a sale. Now, I've known Sam since I was in diapers. He did business with my father, and he's a legend in the industry. He's king of the uh, killer B movies. Uh, there are very few people who know more about the film industry than uh, Sam Sherman. And he took us on personally because he, he was going to watch the film. You know, it's a favor. Mm-hmm. Give me a few pointers. Mm -hmm. And I figure pat Mm -hmm. me on the head and say, well, you know, this is what you could do different. And uh, film screens about an hour and 47 minutes uh, after I sent him um, an online screener. He was back Mm -hmm. on the phone with me uh, an hour and 57 minutes later. (laughs) Wow. Yeah, I, I was I was actually shocked. I figured I'd hear from him in a week or so. And Sam is not exactly effusive. He's a very sober fellow. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he said, <laughs> Ethan, you have a very saleable motion picture. Now, from Sam, that's like, <laughs> yes, that's, that, that, is, if that is great enthusiasm. And, you know, he, <laughs> he pointed out things that he might have done differently. He said, but, you know, mm-hmm. people can sell the movie as is. Uh, it's mm-hmm. really a good film. He said, you got great production value, great acting, original music. It's good music. He said, uh, you know, this this is going to sell, and I want to do it for you. So be patient. Give me a few months, and uh, we'll sell the movie. So that's, that's where we're awesome. at. That is, that is, that is yeah. just that, – so that's, that's amazing. He's uh, working yeah. on worldwide rights for us right now. Oh, awesome. that, that So that I'm, in, I'm in the best hands. No, that Excellent. is that is absolutely brilliant. The I, I wanted to 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 actually ask you, um, especially about uh, two characters, and uh, obviously yourself, uh, but of course mm-hmm. the man himself, Eric Roberts. Um, the, <laughs> the, the the portrayal that Eric had of his character, I absolutely adored because to me he he play he could have played this as a really serious hood. But he doesn't. He plays it like a, um, a what do you say, a, a big fish in a small pond, um, a, a man who hasn't really truly grown up. He wants to be respected as a big criminal, but he's still a mama's boy to some degree. Um, mm-hmm. would, would, would I be reading the character correctly? Oh, have we lost Ethan? Oh, did we lose our guest? Uh oh! I, I think we may have some technical difficulties, or that question just blew him away, and he needs <laughs> a moment to think. Um, <laughs> that's okay. We'll just we'll just pause quickly, and we'll be right back. And we're back. Sorry about that. Just a slight technical difficulty. Um, but uh, but Ethan, you did you did hear what I was saying uh, in regards to to Eric Roberts' character being a mama's boy. Yes. <laughs> Eric's a mama's boy. Yeah, well, I got a secret. Eric Roberts is a mama's boy. He's a mama's boy. Mama. You want your mama. That's what we used to say to him between takes. Oh, what's your mama? Eric was a prince. I mean, he was amazing. 
Yeah. I heard on one of the interviews I was doing with them, um, one of the other podcasts, <laughs> uh, that, uh, he said he based his character on Dog the Bounty Hunter, oh, which no. I thought was fantastic. <laughs> now, yeah, I don't right. know that you have Dog the Bounty Hunter. Oh, we're, we're aware of Dog the Bounty oh, Hunter, okay. yes, yeah. <laughs> I, I wasn't. I had to go and find out who this guy was after oh, I heard yeah, 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 yeah. So I, I thought it was great. And yeah, you know, he's like, he's this big fish in his mind in a small town. But yes. It, yes, it was great. And he just went to town and he had a lot of fun. And I was just so happy that he really was having a good time. And the more we mm-hmm. were working together, the more he just really let loose and have a good time. And, you know, he was on my bucket list of people that I wanted to work with uh, as an actor. Oh, wow. And, you know, to have my two other acting brothers be able to have scenes with him and then for all of us to be on set together uh, was just, you know, that's that was one of the biggest thrills for me. Because my two my two brothers in terms of acting were my idols. Uh, I've got three older brothers and I look up to all of them. Uh, But, you know, and Richard, the oldest, actually was on set. He's a shadow in the wall. He looks like a mistake. He looks like a cameraman that can be seen in the background. Uh, when Eric <laughs> and when Eric and Marty enter the flop house where Itchy uh, lives, the uh, mm-hmm. heroin addict, um, mm-hmm. there's a shadow on the back wall. Well, that is the fourth Martin brother. That's oh. Richard, the old. <laughs> so he's he's just an addict who's leaning up against the glass, just so I could have all the brothers in one scene together. That's so, so cool. Was that, so that was a bit of a, an Alan Older moment. I, I remember in MASH when he got to work with his father and his brother uh, yeah. in, in a one scene. So that, oh, that is absolutely fantastic. That's really cool. Yeah, that's yeah, really cool. That, that, is, that is really fantastic. The, the, because one of the things that, one of the scenes that actually blew my mind uh, in it, I thought it was so funny, is when um, Eric is actually trying to sneak into your apartment. <laughs> And when they're and they're discussing the masks, should they wear the masks or shouldn't they wear the masks? And one of my favorite scenes. And, and, and when he sneaks in, and I think I said during the review, it reminded me of Don Adams in Get Smart with that sort of. <laughs> it, it, it wasn't. It, it, it Would was you so, believe? <laughs> it was so well done. It was so well done. Um, it was just. It was a brilliant little scene. Uh, and, and that's that's the thing I loved about this: the comedy. Um, mm-hmm. You know, even though we're seeing some very serious shit, um, mm-hmm. there there is so much comedy which is put in. And I wouldn't even say humor. I would say there were some scenes where I laughed out loud. They were yeah. very, very funny. Well, you know, it's funny. You bring up that scene, and I don't want to get into the particulars because I don't want to give it away. But, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the comedy came from things that were just funny. Nobody played the comedy. It just was yeah. naturally funny. So, oh, you know, cool. I was surrounded, surrounded by really good actors with great comic timing – and they understood that you don't play comedy, you play the scene as it is, and some things are just naturally funny, as in life. So, you know, earlier we were talking about, you know, the performances, and some of this was really funny in a dark way, and some of it was dramatic, but that's how life is. I mean, some things are just funny, some things are just dramatic, yeah. and I think that's yeah. one of the reasons – this plays so well because we threw formulas out the window and we just wanted mm-hmm. to tell intersecting stories that all collided and ended, you know, in one, you know, climax. But mm-hmm. along the way, we just let the stories unfold. And frankly, as we were writing this, uh, we just let the stories uh, be told by the characters instead of trying to force a situation down each character's throat that makes sense Mm -hmm. yeah so we talked about that we talked about that scene with the masks and what was really cool about that was that really it's sleight of hand uh and one of my favorite things musically if you go back and rewatch that you'll notice there's some just bizarre calliope music as they're walking uh, down the hallway in the masks and it's that music 
that is just a sleight of hand. So you don't expect what's coming because mm. you know, you're too busy just laughing at the goofiness of the situation. Right. And we right. we do we just do that throughout. It's sleight of hand. And I think that was one of the things we did really well. It's you know, not just the lines, it's not just the acting, it's the cinematography maybe takes you in one direction, sets one mood, and then you get hit with another. It's the music sets one mood, and then you get hit with something else. Uh, the comedy, you know, mm-hmm. either in response to or in setting something else up, uh, just, you know, you just, you shouldn't know what's coming. And when you think you do, that's when we backhand you. And I'm yes. proud of that. I'm just oh, proud yeah. of that. Yeah. yeah, you backhanded me a lot in this movie. You caught me off guard so many times. That's right. <laughs> That's just, right, Montana. Yeah. I, yeah, I, was, I, I was black and blue. Yeah, I, was, <laughs> I was black and blue by in this movie. I got backhanded so many times. No. Yeah, wonderful, surprising performances. You wanted to ask about um, the hitman, Carrie, didn't you, Warren? Oh, it's the, it's the dental floss. I had to ask about the dental <laughs> floss. <laughs> Um, it's, uh, I, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> dental floss and a gun. Um, it's like a killer, but he has good dental hygiene Gee. and he's, you know, been in prison for 15 years. I imagine he had something cut in his teeth for a good deal of that time. And, you know, he was, he was going to root out this awful dark stuff, uh, you know, no. You know, he just he had to get it out. Get I just it out. Like the darkness in his heart can only be uh, solved by out. floss. <laughs> just, that's that's very much the way I saw it. Actually, just when I, I sort of imagined this character who was had been in prison in solitary confinement to a degree, and the only way he could keep his mind clean not just his body, but his mind clean, was undertaking some action of cleanliness. And for that, Hmm. that was cleaning his teeth. It was the only thing he could do. Uh, And so when he's released, he continues that because this is his way of trying to keep his mind to what he perceives anyway as being healthy. Yes, Ooh. well, I assure you they did not give him floss wow. in prison. Right. <laughs> I, would have, I would have used a stick or whatever thing I could have. But yes, uh, he he was an animal, which was really funny. The director and I discussed the fact that I would be uh, – I would greet Eric Roberts' character Booker the way that my character greeted him. <laughs> I'm trying not to give it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you have to see the movie, Pete. And I've got he was like, my head right now. (laughs) Yes, and and he was like, "Nah, we're not going to go there." And I said, "Yeah, come on. Um, (laughs) He's an animal. He's the guy's an animal. Mm -hmm. He's been caged up. I was actually going to crouch in the chair Mm -hmm. and squat in the chair because in (laughs) Vietnam that's how they sit. They they just they squat. Mm -hmm. So I was actually going to be in the (laughs) chair, but in a and that was too much for him. <laughs> oh, what, that is- what the poor hey, director, what oh, the yeah, poor director didn't know was uh, we discussed, you know, some type of scarring, and he's like, "Nah, nah, nah, you don't need any of that." And I thought, you know, there's a reason this guy is so messed up, and I had my own right. backstory and actor secrets mm-hmm. in my head, but mm-hmm. you know, I I took my special effects makeup guy who was really bored, and he was looking for something to do, so I said, "Hey, come here." And I said, <laughs> fuck me up. <laughs> it's like, what? And I said, you know, from the, from, you know, the bottom of my neck straight down, just ripped me to shreds. And he went to town. He was like, really? I'm like, yep. He said, well, let's uh, let, and I'm like, uh, 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 uh. nobody else knows. <laughs> nobody knows. So, the first that the director knew that I was in the condition I was in was when I walked on set and he was like, and my mouth for all of you people is just a gate. Oh, brilliant. Poor Rusty. I tormented (laughs) Rusty and I walk in there in a towel and this, and I sit in the chair (laughs) and I drop the towel and that's how I sat for however long uh, we were shooting that scene and somebody was like oh wow l- let me tell eric and i'm like ah, ah, ah. 
He doesn't know about this. He doesn't know about this. Nor would he want to know until he opens right. that door in right. character wow. and sees me. And then it'll be mano a mano, actor to actor, and it'll be great because I want the camera on him and his reaction first. And <laughs> when so- somebody actually went to Eric and started to say, oh, you should say, and he said, uh-uh, I don't want to know. <laughs> Good. Good. No, I don't want to know. No. no well, perfect. Eric's a- Eric's an actor's actor. He's, mm-hmm. and I, I have to say this: a lot of people don't realize he's Royal Shakespeare Academy trained. Mm-hmm. So the man is so capable of doing so much, you know. And mm-hmm. people, people will not forget, you know, the performances uh, that he gave in things like Runaway Train, which I yes. think is where he got his mm-hmm. Academy Award nomination, and Pope of Greenwich Village, and mm-hmm. frankly, um, Raggedy Man is the first time I saw him on screen when I was younger, mm-hmm. and I, you know, at that moment uh, with Sissy Spacek, it was like I knew this guy was somebody I wanted to keep an eye on. He was incredible, but man, Pope of Greenwich Village, who wasn't uh, who wasn't imitating him? Oh, I took my th- you know, I'm sure he's just. <laughs> I resisted saying that the entire time I was on <laughs> you set did it, with you him. <laughs> you got it no, 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 not on set. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Well, we, we we have you so know, and Star Eighty, holy yeah, mother of God. What I mean, you know, in all these hundreds of performances. I mean, listen, mm-hmm. he might have been in some, he might have been in some films that were not you know worthy of his talents, but. He is always amazing to watch, and he was mm-hmm. even more amazing, more amazing to work with. Oh, yeah, we so. absolutely love Eric Roberts. I'm sure you already know our grading scale on the show is actually on a scale of one to five. Eric Roberts, five. Eric Roberts being the highest honor you can get on a film. So I mean, we love Robert. I, love I, you I, I was, got to work with him. <laughs> yes, yes, and so did Seth Martin and Jonathan Martin and Stacy Whittle and Amanda <laughs> Victoria. Dunn was amazing as well. I mean, he had all these great performances. I'm so proud of these guys. I'm just so proud of them. Okay. Oh, uh, Chris, yeah. Chris Van Cleve, one of my favorite moments. I have so many favorite moments, but after one of the characters gets shot, and I don't think that gives anything away because there's so many of them that get shot. Shot, yep. Uh, when, when he breaks into song. Oh, and I don't know. oh yes. Oh, my God, yes. That scene. I got to tell you. That scene. I, Warren, I don't know why, but I knew when Velvet saw that scene, it was just going to <gasps> blow her mind. Oh, and it did. And it, <laughs> I did. Like, I, it did. You know, it's like, like... I was like, this movie, I don't know what is going to happen in this movie. What is going on? It's amazing. It is just... Okay, it's I, a drama, but there's funny stuff. Oh, now we got music. I mean, it's... Yeah, it's a map. It's yeah, actually. Chris Van Cleve uh, actually performed uh, British West End. So he did Le Mis, wow. he did Chess. <laughs> this guy, oh, wow. I mean, we had major talent in this film. So it was, it was just incredible. Oh, and, so, and, and, yeah. And, and the end product that you, you know, you yeah. have is just awesome. Um, you know, the, the performances are fantastic. The writing yeah. is fantastic. The cinematography is fantastic. Um, I mean, I think at the time we said mm-hmm. there were a couple of little, you know, little faults here and there, but God. What? It's an independent there, film. You know, Go ahead. You have three was- seconds. Today. <laughs> 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 it's an independent film, though, and that's also no what fun. makes yeah, it amazing. And, 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 and it's mean- not... You know, it's not your typical Hollywood. Okay, well, we're going to make sure that we baby feed the audience so they know everything. I mean, you know, you let the people think and interpret. And, you know, we love also more time. Warren and I are fucking obsessed with your performance in this film. And literally, I did not even know you were in this movie because when you first, you know, when we first got in contact, you're like, hey, check out this independent. Hey, Warren, we should check out this independent film. They actually send us a screener watch it we start doing our homework and i'm like holy shit that's the guy that sent us the movie he's in this movie and i didn't even recognize him. that's how amazing you are I recognize you at fucking until oh, well, after the fact yeah relatives relatives did okay. not recognize me on set i'm happy to say as a matter oh, of fact my, my unit my production God. manager <laughs> uh came up my unit production manager came up to me later and I'd already been pretty friendly with Eric, but we hadn't done 
our scenes together yet. So I'm sure he was looking forward to uh, a rank amateur, you know, who was producing his uh, movie, getting on screen with him. And he comes out having done the first take of our first scene together, which is, mm-hmm. you know, my, minus towel. And he comes out, <laughs> and he, turn, he turns to uh, Sarah Beth Yemulkovsky, our unit production manager, and he says, that guy scared the shit out of me. <laughs> and I, you know, oh, my God. <laughs> you are really scary in this movie. I mean, like, seriously, I was just like, wow, this guy is an amazing actor because you're really Was I scarier than well- rats filled with plague? <laughs> yes, yes, ah. yes. I will take the rats filled with plague over <laughs> carry the hitman any day. <laughs> very scary. Wow, very quotable. <laughs> <laughs> Now we should we should obviously mention um, your company, um, Ethan, because I don't think we have as yet. Um, because of course uh, there is more than just um, eyes of the Roshi. Yeah. Uh, oh. And yes, yeah, so, oh. you know, please please tell us about your um, about your company. Well, Light Age Films is my production company, and I started it a few years back after I had assisted in producing a film with Michael Rooker, and it was just time for me to branch out and do my own thing. So my brothers and I finally started to work on a film, uh, shooting it, that we had been planning, writing, and Uh, putting together since 1994, and that was White Buffalo, an American prophecy. So basically, we fast-forwarded on actually starting to shoot that movie, and that's a film involving uh, indigenous wisdom with uh, First Nations people of the Americas, Turtle Island, um, and the original Americans. And we are in post-production with that film, And that one I'm also very excited about. It's a real passion project. Beautiful Mm -hmm. film. We've been everywhere. We've been talking to uh, the Lakota, the Hopi, Cherokee, uh, also rabbis, Rinpoches, Rastafarians. Uh, It's a film project about bringing uh, people of the world together. Uh, And as Lakota would say, it's about the mending of the sacred hoop. That wow. is that. That's amazing, and and it definitely, it really definitely at this point in time, two thousand and seventeen, bringing the world together is a message that I think so many of us need to take a hell of a lot more seriously than we are at mm-hmm. the moment. Um, yeah. And uh, but but also just for me, the the, yeah. the idea of the indigenous culture, because obviously myself being Australian, um, we have a very similar background in regards to the history. The Aboriginals. Yes, exactly right. Mm-hmm. And uh, mm-hmm. and I suppose that coming from nations such as the United States or coming from a country like Australia, it's very mm-hmm. different to say um, nations within, let's say, Africa, where the Indigenous culture always outnumbered the newcomers. And when mm-hmm. independence could then come to those nations – well, maybe not. They, 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 they were then had the ability to form their own, regain their own cultures uh, within their nat- nations. And I know it's a lot more complicated than that. But the thing about, I suppose, for people like us in Australia and the United States, the newcomers overwhelmed the Indigenous populations. Mm-hmm. And, and I think it's wonderful that the stories get retold because so often today they're lost. Well... I even go a step further. It's, you know, the indigenous cultures welcomed the newcomers. And the newcomers, especially in the Americas, would not have survived without the indigenous peoples. And so it it was insult to injury uh, what happened to them. For me, it's a way to give the indigenous peoples or the wisdom keepers – a microphone, if you will, uh, a platform to tell their own stories unfiltered uh, and so that they won't be lost to future generations or, as they like to say, the seventh generation. And they're the people who lived in harmony 
uh, with the environment and with the earth. Uh, they have a saying, it's metakue oyasin, it's all our relations. So for them, everything has a living uh, spirit. So they don't talk about trees as something inanimate. They're the standing tall people or mm. the buff. The Buffalo Nation or the Four Leggeds or the Water Spirits. Everything has life. So when they talk about all the relations, they're not talking about just their human relations. They're talking about literally uh, the earth as an organic whole. They even talk about the stone people, uh, which to them is the you know oldest uh, relative that we have. So – there's a lot of wisdom to be uh, learned, and one of the important messages, I think, from the film is that uh, we shouldn't assume, and we should sit respectfully and listen to each other and learn from each other. Yes. There's, what a yeah, wonderful message. Yeah, I can't wait to see this. And if there's, if there's a certain man in a spray booth right now, listen to that message, please. <laughs> it's important but um no 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 i, I hear I, that the best way to reach him is through the media so maybe yes maybe. yes <laughs> we'll tweet it we'll tweet it uh, <laughs> um but I, I know when my my daughter was growing up um one thing that we we did was um we made sure that she read um, uh, books which of the Dreamtime in Australia, which is the the origins of Aboriginal culture. It's it's Aboriginal religion, um, yep. and we made sure that you know she would read those. She'd she'd read stories about the princess and the you know and the prince and all the rest of it, but she would also read stories about the giant turtle and the you know all these um. other stories because I have always felt that it's important that we grow up understanding the cultures of everyone around us not just the one that we may belong to because right. we all live mm -hmm. side by side we all live in yeah. streets we live in apartment blocks and it's important that we understand the origins of the um the jewish family below us or the muslim family above us or the indigenous mm -hmm. family to the side of us um and unless we do understand that we're, we're never going to grow as a, as a species, um, and we're never going to save what's left of this planet. Sorry, I'm getting all pinko here, but... Um, no, no, no. You know, <laughs> I, that's, I don't think that's pinko. I just think that's uh, a well-reasoned uh, thought process. You know, I like, yeah, to I, so. tell, I, I like to tell people, I said, now, remember, we're all indigenous. Mm -hmm. Yes. Very, so, very well go. said. Thanks. With... With, with things, you know, yes, and with uh, technology, uh, you know, growing at the rate it's growing, uh, the world keeps getting smaller and smaller. So it's yes. really not a, it's not a bad thing to be kind to your neighbor and to be understanding <laughs> of your neighbor. Well, it's, it's, exactly. it's, it's one thing, Ethan, that I, I don't know how you feel about it, but I love social media, not necessarily using social media, but the concept of it, because mm -hmm. the more people from different cultures it brings together in conversation, the less likely you are to vote for your country to go to war to kill somebody if you right. suddenly know who the hell they are. Right. Well, I think understanding, mutual understanding, uh, is an important thing. And, you know, I think people of reason and peace – can make good things happen. People who think before they act, and uh, you know, I'm I'm hoping that you you are right. I'm hoping to God you are right. Well, fingers but, crossed. Yep, <laughs> they are, and the toes, and the toes. <laughs> <laughs> you, <So> you pinko. <laughs> you pinko. Oh yes, I'm just an old lefty at heart. Oh well. <laughs> And when can or where can people see White Buffalo and American Prophecy? Well, again, that's in post-production now. So we're editing that one as well. So okay. uh, Eyes of the Roshi will probably, uh, you know, I'm hoping that we'll be uh, distributed, uh, even get some theatrical uh, within the next four to six months. And I'm thinking mm -hmm. that by the end of summer 2017 we'll be ready to uh, have our red carpet for uh, white buffalo 
Ooh, Fantastic. So listen, stay tuned. I know where to find you. You guys are all over Twitter. You know where to find me too. <laughs> definitely, yes. Oh, definitely. definitely. Yeah, with, oh, without, way, without there, doubt. There are a couple things I've got to mention before we wrap up. I mean, yeah, definitely shout out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, first, I have to mention uh, the music. Our editor, Bill Gauntz, and our music director, uh, Wade Mosier. Uh, they created the majority of this music, and they placed it, and they did s- such an amazing job. And Bill, as editor, was, I mean, he, he was amazing. He really created uh, great moments uh, just with microscopic precision. So I thank him for that. And uh, I've got some people who are out in Australia, Woo-hoo. some relatives. I, I've got Elizabeth. And Clark Barrett, and uh, Clark is one hell of an artist. So if you haven't seen any of his uh, paintings from the Outback in Broken Hill, you guys are missing out. And my niece, Andia Darling, uh, her dance name is Diesel Darling. So if uh, you're into uh, burlesque, she's one of the best. So go out and find her. And Taylor, I know you're out there, so I love you guys. And I miss you, and I can't wait to get back out to Australia to see you guys. There. Oh, it's so, yeah. (laughs) 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 Absolutely. I love my family. I love my family. Oh, no, that's that's brilliant. By the way, how old is your daughter, Warren? Oh, she's 25 now. Uh, oh, she's really? all, oh, she's all grown up, moved out of home and, and, uh, all the rest of it. Uh, she's yeah, very, <laughs> very proud of it. She's a nurse and, uh, she's, uh, uh, she grew up right. I think we did the right thing with her. She's a, a very, very, um, caring individual who not only cares for her family and friends, but cares for the, uh, the environment, cares for the world around her. Um, she pisses everybody off on social media because she's always tweeting about <laughs> uh, about green policy and all the rest of it. But I'm very proud of her, and I, I think we raised her well. Good job, good job. She'd love my uh, my daughter Hannah, who's 26. Sounds like they would have a lot in common. I think nice. they would. I think they would. <laughs> we, uh, we 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 always we, we always brought we always decided that um, you know she should be very well rounded in education, uh, and so that was everything from the humanities through to the sciences, uh, through to um, you know the environment, through to business, because I just think the more you know about the world around you, the, the the better life will be for you and also the better life will be for others around you. Well, that's a beautiful thought. Good yeah, job. Totally. So, uh, now, now, Velvet, I don't want you to feel left out. Uh, tell, us about <laughs> your, tell us about your Yeti. Tell us about oh, your Yeti. I have a four-legged child. It's a traditional Sharpe. I've had her since she was two months old, and she'll turn seven years old this year. So that's my baby. <laughs> And that's Congratulations. it Congratulations. <laughs> All right. <good>. Thank you. <laughs> <You're welcome. laughs> okay. Ethan, do you have any social media or anything that you'd like to shout out before you leave us? Um, where can people follow you on social media? Um, go on. Anything you want. Phone numbers, addresses, go for it. <laughs> Stock portfolios. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Or you do, 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 very do it. tricky. Velvet. I was about to say. Uh, I was about to say, Ethan. Do it. <laughs> that mountain retreat in Montana. I was about to say, Ethan. Do a Sean Spicer and give us your password. Yeah, that's gonna happen. Actually, Montana five four six. You can find uh, me on uh, Facebook and Twitter and. Certainly Eyes of the Roshi, R-O-S-H-I, on Facebook and Twitter. And it's really us talking to you. So, you know, we have a lot of fun. So if you talk to us, we will respond. And we like to use the hashtag, we want Roshi film, R-O-S-H-I. And that's how the distributors are finding us. So demand it. Demand to see this film. We want Roshi. 
Yeah. Yes, yeah, we you do. have a pretty loyal fan base because I, I mentioned this when we reviewed it. That mm. before we reviewed this film, you know, we always have people tweeting us, emailing us for suggestions, and this one was literally the most requested movie we've ever had for review. People were like, "Review Eyes of Roshi. Review do Eyes of Roshi. Have you heard of Eyes of Roshi? You need to do Eyes of <laughs> like God bless okay. our but, crazy yes. cultish yes. following. I mean, this is yes, amazing. So. I, yeah. I can't wait until we have a legitimate distribution because we've already got such a loyal following and yeah people are going to no, show up God. dressed up like grandmaster adam they're going to be <laughs> going to be karate that, fighting and doing zen poses outside the exactly theater. I mean, ringing. it's, it's going to be amazing <laughs> i can't wait i can't wait we'll have 20 people dressed as carrie which will be great because <laughs> all, all the hair cutter he has to do is set up across the street and they'll make a mint Oh, yeah. oh, and, you know, floss sales will increase. People will be walking around with floss hanging out of their teeth. I mean, it's going to be amazing. Absolutely. You know, I, I hear that <laughs> as as Eyes of the Roshi started getting seen, uh, sales of floss went up 5% in the States. <laughs> oh and in neighborhoods where Roshi plays, the local pharmacies sell out of the floss. <laughs> <laughs> it's oh my it's god! Amazing. It's- I mean, I see, I see people on the street. Awesome. I said, well, if that guy can floss, so I it's- feel really good yeah. because I've started a floss uh, epidemic. revolution, it's- epidemic yes. revolution, a floss yes, it's on- <laughs> revolution. It's- it sounds much better. Oh. An epidemic sounds like a play. Oh my goodness! Well, let's. Oh. <laughs> Nit, nit's time By the way, I see you a did want to know where that you did want to know where that tick came from, so I feel obligated <laughs> to at least yes. tell you one last story. <laughs> my, my dear friend and uh, fellow actress in this film, uh, Stacy Whittle, who plays uh, Eric Roberts' uh, girlfriend in, in the yes. film, and yep. the stripper uh, Sandy Kane. She's she is a floss addict, and. <laughs> I, you know, it, it didn't matter. If you thought that Carrie liked to floss, she makes him look like uh, he's got the nastiest teeth going. She flosses. In real life. In real oh, yeah. Life. She just, really? well, she would often say, well, you know, Ethan, if you floss properly, it's better for your teeth than brushing. And I'm like, okay, okay. <laughs> so she, she just loves flossing. So okay. I was looking, I was looking for a character tick. And I saw her, and it was like the idea clicked at the same time. So I didn't have to say anything. She just held out her floss to me, and I never gave it back. And that was it. So oh my floss, wow. floss, was, <laughs> floss was born in that moment. And she said, yes, that will be your, your tick. Oh, so that, is, okay. that is brilliant. That is absolutely <laughs> brilliant. Is brilliant. That is brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing so much um, behind the scenes stories with us. I mean, that's one of my favorite things about films. Once you've watched the film, you want to learn as much as you can about the actors, their experience, what went on behind the scenes. And I mean, hearing it directly from the actor is just that's that's gold. So thank you for sharing that with us, Ethan. Well, you're very welcome. And one last shout out to our director. Uh, John Mark, Rusty Nail, I hope you've recovered from the experience by now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, I, 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 I know that dealing with us, especially four Martin brothers on one set, and then since we adopted <laughs> Eric Roberts and he became the fifth brother, kind of like the Marx brothers, um, I, you know, we, we, we worked very hard to drive him into uh, you know, the nut house. And luckily, we <laughs> did not we did not succeed. So, John Mark, I, I hope you're doing well. Oh, yes, no, most <laughs> definitely. And, and so, oh, just very quickly before we wrap up, I know we have to go. We've sure. kept you for way too long. But we've been having such a great time. I time's just- up. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the, the stopwatch oh, clicked oh, over. One more, one the, stop, the stopwatch clicked over <laughs> hours ago, I think. Um, the, um, the, the, yeah, um, I just want to time's quickly. Up. Tell me where you could have won, Johnny. <laughs> Tell me where you could have won. <laughs> <laughs> you 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 mentioned your father before, and um, you um, I mean obviously you know you uh, grew up in a, a household um, of movie lovers, um, but you mentioned that your father obviously worked in film distribution. Um, now, is it true that he actually was one of the distributors for Plan Nine from Outer Space? He was the person who got it distributed. Oh wow! wow. 
there wow. is a funny story, and you just don't have time for that. But I tell you what I will do, uh, because every year for a birthday or an anniversary, whenever we could just just beg him to tell the story of Plane 9 from Outer Space. He would tell us how the original producer came into his office, having sunk every last penny he had into the film and needing to get it back, and how my dad was able to sell Plane 9 from Outer Space. So I am going to send you a link to a blog that I republish every year for my, the anniversary of my dad's birth. And it's his, it's hysterical. So I okay. would just urge I would just urge you guys to go ahead and read it. But yes, my dad uh, Albert E. Martin was responsible for bringing the completion bond to motion pictures. So there's not a major motion picture that's made today that doesn't use a completion bond. And he also produced more than 150 uh, Broadway plays and motion pictures. Wow! Wow! Wow. So, yeah, busy we grew man. up with that. Busy man. Mom, mom, <laughs> wrote, mom wrote 20 novels. And, wow. uh, yeah, I came from a slightly artistic family. Only it's, well, slightly. It's, slight, it's something, <laughs> Only slightly. something that to be, I mean, I mean, I would, you know, obviously know that they're very proud of you, but obviously mm. you must be so proud of all of them, you know, at the same time. They were my idols. Uh, you know, Aww. I. I, I looked up to my brothers, I looked up to mom and dad, and, uh, you know, the, the dinner table was, you know, it was, you didn't have to go to the movie theater, you didn't have to turn on the TV, because uh, it was so entertaining being at the breakfast or dinner table together. Just so much laughter. And Aww. I think it was about, I was about three years old when I turned to my brother, Seth, and I said, when will I be funny, too? Because I thought somebody flipped the switch at a certain age and then uh, it's yeah. funny like everybody else. So I just I, I could not wait to join the act. Uh, and poor mom <laughs> was like, uh, you know, I refer to us as the Marx Brothers because we had an affinity for uh, the Marx Brothers growing up and Lenny Bruce and all these things. But we treated mom like Margaret Dumont. So if you know anything <laughs> yeah. about the Marx Brothers. Oh, right? yeah. But poor mom suffered, <laughs> but she loved it. She loved it. Oh, that's that. That is that's a wonderful <laughs> story. That's a wonderful story. Or right, look, we have kept you way over time, and we do apologise for that. But we had such a wonderful time talking to you, and uh, I, yeah. I, I I could talk for another hour, but I know you have to go. Absolutely. Um, so. Yeah. I just want to thank you so much for coming on the show, uh, for talking about um, uh, Eyes of the Roshi and, of course, um, Light Age Films White and White Buffalo. Um, so um, it's – I did say Light Age. I thought I said something else. There. Anyway, I thought you said White Age. Yeah, I think I did, actually. <laughs> I, one of those Freudian – I don't know it's a Freudian slip, but one of those slips. Anyway, um, so, <laughs> yes, Light Age Films. You'll be, uh, you'll be joining Steve Bannon for cocktails later, I <laughs> 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 And Keith <laughs> Oh, yes. One political <laughs> slip of the tongue. It's a joke, guys. It's a joke. <laughs> Please, Please, don't tweet about that welcome. and – don't send the email. <laughs> oh, look, it's, it's the, the Lenny the Bruce. The Lenny the Bruce show. in me is coming out. <laughs> oh, oh. oh, dear. Look, thank you so much for uh, for being on. And uh, so you, you, you have an yeah, open, you. open invitation anytime, you know, you yes. would like to. Uh, Great. What are you doing next uh, week? Come back. Yes, we'll oh, be here. Yeah, oh. we would love <laughs> I see. Week. I see. We would love, <laughs> that's such an open invitation. On, we would love to hear opinion on some of the. You know, if you ever want to come on for a review episode, we'd love to have you. Because I'm sure you have a few. <laughs> No, no, no. I'll come on. I'll come on for comedic. Uh, enter- I'll, I'll I'll entertain. But no, I, I feel no need yourself. to review. I re- I need. I will not review others' work. I have too much respect for what it takes. Fair you know, when enough. I was oh, when yeah. I was a kid, when I was really yeah. young, I worked on a film with uh, Jason Robards. Piper Laurie, Harry Dean Stanton, Corey Feldman, and Corey oh, Howe. Wow. And it was called uh, Dream a Little Dream. I and- have. <laughs> yes, I remember that movie. 
Yes. And my elbow made it into the uh, final cut of the film. And <laughs> we worked on that film night and day for like three months in the bitter cold in Wilmington, North Carolina. I mean, just bitter, Oof. bitter cold, mm. long hours. I remember somebody once took a picture of us, and we looked like zombies. We'd been up for 15, 18 hours, and I remember the caption, oh. never have so many done so much for so little. I mean, it was just... <laughs> and I got into uh, just uh, wonderful situations with, you know, Jason... <laughs> Robards and Harry Dean Stanton. It, it was amazing. And I remember going to the theater when the film came out and being so excited because I'd worked on this film. And after watching the mm-hmm. first five minutes in the credits, it was amazing. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I worked on this film. And from that five minutes beyond, it, it just tanked. The editing was, it, oh. I just fell apart. And I said, oh my God, I worked on this film. And <laughs> <laughs> you know, from that moment on, I said, ah, everybody on that set, from the producer to the director to the crew, everybody mm-hmm. worked their hearts out on this film. They worked mm-hmm. so hard. And mm-hmm. I realized how much work can go into making a film that just doesn't quite make it. And I mm-hmm. thought, you know what? From now on, I understand, I respect what it takes even to make a film mm-hmm. that isn't successful. And God mm-hmm. bless anybody who can get out there, put the deal together, make it happen, employ people, feed them and their families. And uh, I have no need, no desire to knock anybody else's film once you've been on the other side and see how much you know, blood, sweat, and tears goes into making anything. I will leave that to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, we totally respect and we agree with that opinion. We voice that opinion also because although we do make fun of movies, when it comes to independent films, we always like to stress that, hey, these people are working their asses off with no budget. What we don't excuse are the films that have, you know, a multi-million dollar budget and they have sloppy editing and it's obviously just not. They didn't care. <laughs> and they have all these resources at their disposal. So we can totally agree with what you just said. Well, I think so in other words, let's gang up on them. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I, I think I think just just finally there was just just finally there was there was I think it was David Bowie who made the comment there is no such thing as a bad song because even if a song tanks somewhere, somewhere in the world, there will be someone sitting in their bedroom who bought a record and to this day says that's the best song I ever heard. Yes. All right. Yes. And, and yes. for the most part, I would agree. However, obviously, David Bowie never heard William Shatner's Strawberry <laughs> Fields. <Fortress. laughs> Oh, that is uh, that is that is a great point to end on. I think that is a great point to end. So, look, um, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And damn it, um, James, I'm not a singer. <laughs> <laughs> William, come on, you know I love you. Oh, it's it's oh, it's a- I'm kidding. <laughs> kidding. Live long and and prosper, William. <laughs> oh my goodness! Guys, oh my goodness! It's been a lot of fun, and sure. I'll come back anytime you need me. Thank you Excellent. so much. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you so Thank much. You. All right. Well, we'll just take a quick break and we'll be right back. It's time to get excited, short film fans. It's mini movie review time. Yes, it most definitely is. And uh, uh, oh, I've got to get my mindset back into talking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was that was just that was so much fun uh, talking to Ethan. Yes. That was just that was just yes. that was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Um, now you have a fantastic offering as always for us in the mini movie review, uh, Velvet. Yes. All right. So this week our mini movie is Plague of the Pot Rabbits. So this is a social commentary on the current state of cannabis laws in the United States. And this was actually inspired by something that a DEA agent in the United States said, Matt Fairbanks, so special agent for the DEA. That's the, you know, people that handle illegal drugs and all that fun stuff. And basically his concern was that if they legalize marijuana, 
in Utah that all the wildlife may cultivate a taste for the plant, lose their fear of humans, and just be high all the time. <laughs> and so right. this uh, mini movie, exactly, yeah, um, it's it's very based in science, as you can see. But uh, the the actual mini movie is just uh, it's just a little commentary on this. It's a very funny short. It runs about uh, thirteen minutes. And it's basically, it's uh, farmers find out that some kind of critter has damaged the crop. And the next thing they know, it's plague of the pot rabbits. And you just have to see it to believe it. This is very cheaply done, but it is so funny. I was literally laughing out loud. I thought this was really fun, really cute. Whether you support legalizing cannabis or not, this is just a fun, enjoyable short that just... It's 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 ridiculous, but I don't know. It, I just thought it was fun. What do you think of it? It's all oh, look, no, no, no. It, it's fun and it's funny all the way through. Um, you know the, yes. the story of these two. I don't know. They're not farmers. They're actually well, they are farmers, but they're actually like pot growers. They're dope growers. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and they're on the illegal end of it, from what I can tell. Yes, they're yes. On the illegal end of it. Yeah, <laughs> and because uh, in, in, in in fact there is a line which I won't say at the very end, which is. Most definitely their political statement on the subject, yes. uh, but I won't yes. say what it is. I'll, I'll let everybody watch it. Um, and which, and I must, <laughs> and I must admit, I agree with them. I actually, I totally agree with them. I mean, it's like, um, it, it's just legalize it, guys. It's just get it out of the hands of it's criminals. Like it doesn't tax it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, get it, it out. Like it doesn't tax it. <laughs> yeah, get it out of the hands of criminals. Get it out of the hands of bikey mm-hmm. gangs. Get it out of the hands of. You know, cartels, or well, not cartels really run the dope business, but you, you know what I mean. Get it out right. of the criminal element, mm-hmm. um, you know, and then right. the government can monitor it the same as they do with alcohol and cigarettes, you know, and, and I think it's uh, – and the other thing too is that we can, you know, like breath test, you know, when the police stop you and breath test you, um, although they mm-hmm. don't actually do that in America, do they? You've got to walk a, a line touching your nose or something. Oh, it crazy. depends. It just depends. On where you are, yeah, it depends depends on the police officer, depends but, on their mood and their quota. <laughs> but but in in, in in all other countries, of course, the police walk up to your door, shove something through the window, and you've got to blow in the bag, uh, you know, to see if you're um, you know legally under the limit. But of course, they can do that for um, drugs now. So um, you know, if if you can drink alcohol, you should be able to smoke dope. That's just my idea. But anyway, we're not talking about that. Um, this movie is it's really it's it's really funny. Um, it's it's really funny. Yeah, it, it really and it, is. And it's obviously made on like no budget, but it's one of those projects where it's okay that it doesn't have a really high budget because they get their point across it's comedic it's funny um michael fullerton is the one who directed this and he's actually in this he's the main character <laughs> so not the one with the long hair but the one with the short hair and uh it just i don't know you have to see this it's just um it reminds me of movies that are uh, cult classics. It makes me think of Night of the Lepus with the killer rabbit. Yes, I was just, thinking that myself. Is, yes, which is ridiculous, and but it's like so bad it's good. And of course, it makes me think of Monty Python and uh, the Holy Grail when you know the knights are being attacked by the, the rabbits. Oh, by the rabbits. <laughs> yes, I know. And in fact, the closest thing we could actually say about this movie is it's. Um, it, it's it's more like the Monty Python. Um, it is. Yes, yes, they're, yes. It, they're not supersized rabbits. They're normal sized bunny rabbits, <laughs> um, and and that's what makes it so funny. You know, it funny. It, it really does work well. <laughs> And they they make the rabbits move. I mean, I don't I don't want to spoil it because that's part of the fun is when you actually see the rabbits and you're like, oh god, <laughs> you're like, oh god, okay. But it they actually make them like move a little bit and it just I don't know. You have to see it, people. They're, um, yeah, they're cheap. They're cheap as shit, but they're they're really fun. <laughs> funny. They really is funny, um, you know. Um, the sound mix on this can be a little bit difficult, so just, you know, turn up the volume a little and just, you know, tune in, and you'll be able to follow along with what's going on. Like I said, it does run about 13 minutes. Um, it's available on YouTube. They also have a website, which is plagueofthepotrabbits.com, where you can watch the short there, and 
Yeah. <laughs> no, it's I, funny I, and you I, have to yeah, see it. Yeah, I, I definitely say check it out. Um, e- even if you're, yeah. you're even if you're not interested in the politics of the situation, um, right. I would, I would still say yeah, yeah, I'd still say watch it. It's still funny, you know. I mean, yes, they're trying to push a message, um, but that's that's fine. You right. don't have to agree with the message. You can still enjoy. You know the piece right. of art they've produced, exactly. And, and it is it's it's exactly. pure comedy. You know, it's poor. It's oh, totally, totally lunatic comedy, and I like a lot of that. You know, so um, no, it, it it is it is fun. It really is. I, I would really recommend. Yeah, it's thirteen minutes. Great fun, very funny. The rabbits are hilarious. Um, it's yes. it's good, and the acting's actually really good. These two dope growers. Yeah. They're very funny. <laughs> they really are. They know? are. They are. Uh, they they and really I, are. I love the poster. They they actually have a promotional, you know, poster for the uh, the short film, and I'll be tweeting that out throughout the week. But it it shows <laughs> it shows a rabbit with fangs. But at the very top of the poster, it says, "Think weed is safe." Think again. Plague of the pot rabbits. Rabbits, yeah. <laughs> I'm just like, yeah. Well done. We love this short. It's we want great. you guys to check it out. Definitely yeah. check it out. And, and, <laughs> and also, I would just say, because of what I said before, I'm not suggesting people do drugs, okay? No, <laughs> all, no we're all, not encouraging no. anybody to do drugs. All, all, no. all I was actually saying is that in the case of one particular drug, maybe it would make more sense to legalize it like other drugs such as tobacco and alcohol. And alcohol. Where I am right. not saying you should go and legalize heroin. All right. Just, I just, <laughs> I want to put that in before people start writing nasty tweets and stuff. All right. So I am not suggesting that by any means. Okay. Oh, that'd be a whole different movie if it was yeah. Plague of the Heroin Rabbit. Yes. <laughs> that'd uh, okay. be a whole different so thing. That's not what I'm <laughs> suggesting. No, but definitely, definitely check it out. It is, it's very funny. It's lots of fun. Um, yeah. It, you, you'll enjoy it. You'll, you'll laugh all the way through it. Yeah, definitely. Most definitely. All right. Well, um, I think it's really time because we haven't really spoken about a proper full-on movie yet. Um, so <laughs> I, I think we should really. Oh no! <laughs> yes, I just played the wrong thing, didn't I? Um, I do this all the time. So we will play the correct filler, and um, I think I'm going. Oh God! Did oh, I? I don't know. <laughs> I'm still in. I'm just still in hysterics <laughs> from talking to Ethan. I just. I can't get anything right at the moment. Anyway, we will be right back with our first movie review. Okay, we are back. Hopefully, I won't be pushing the wrong buttons anymore. Now, um, <laughs> our first movie, and this is this is an interesting one, definitely an interesting one. It is from 2011 called Showgirls 2. Yes, I'm not joking. Showgirls 2, Pennies from Heaven. And it is a... Um, uh, independent film. Uh, it's not a, a mainstream movie. So it's not really the official sequel to Showgirls. Uh, it is an independent movie, which in fact was uh, a Kickstarter movie. Um, uh, mm-hmm. how it originally start, uh, started. Now it stars, um, Rena, um, Riffle and, uh, it was also written, directed, produced and edited, uh, by her. So it is basically her baby. Um, now, if you don't know who she is um, and how we get the title Pennies from Heaven, um, uh, or pe- uh, she was, of course, she played the character Penny in the original Showgirls. Now, um, apart from all her other acting and so forth that she does, she is also an independent filmmaker. Uh, so she decided to make this project. And uh, we'll get to the movie in, in just a second, but it's... Um, uh, the rough idea is it takes off basically, well, what, um, you know, 18 years after the original movie. <laughs> um, and we, uh, uh, it, it follows Penny's life and her continuing ambition to be famous and to be a dancer. Uh, now, of course, we're talking about the Penny character. We're not talking about Elizabeth Berkeley's character here. Um, but it is interesting that a number of the characters uh, from the original movie, in fact, there's three others who are in the original movie, will reappear 
uh, in this film. So, uh, so you know, that's quite interesting within itself. Now, it Penny then basically runs away from uh, Las Vegas and heads off to California uh, to become a movie star on a dance, lo- basically what is meant to be a local TV dancing show. And she will have all sorts of adventures basically on the way and while there. Um, everything from uh, being involved in murders to meeting, getting involved in some neo-Nazi cult uh, to uh, <laughs> it, it, it is, it, I mean there, there are a lot of adventures. There is a lot happening in this movie and it needs a lot happening because it runs for 143 minutes. Um, this two is, and a half hours. This two is a, a long hours. movie, and it is. It's fascinating. I actually watched this with um, Rena's audio commentary, and this original cut was four and a half hours, and it was actually oh, wow. cut down uh, to one hundred and forty-three minutes uh, for the original movie, and it's long. I have to say, you know, it it it, it is long. Um, what did what did you think of uh, Penny's From Heaven Showgirls <laughs> um, Two? Yeah, as usual, I didn't do my homework before I started watching this, so I didn't realize this was an unofficial <laughs> sequel. And then I start watching it, and finally, after a while, I realized, okay, this is definitely, most definitely, a comedy, which is good. You know, we like to laugh. Um, <laughs> there is, um, there's a lot of TNA. So, I mean, they definitely followed up on that. So you get to see lots of boobies. Um, there's lots of dancing. There's lots of spoofing of the original showgirls. So, um, one of my favorite scenes is actually when they do actually spoof the pool scene, the sex scene in the pool. Yes. But instead of it being a man and a woman, it's Penny and another rival dancer <laughs> spoofing the infamous showgirls. Uh, pool sex scene. Um, there was a lot of stuff in this that actually made me laugh. One of them was um, the total stripper culture. Like um, I, I'm a former exotic dancer, so a lot of this stuff I could actually really relate to. Uh, especially like it's kind of funny because she's obviously playing an over the hill stripper. I've since retired from my dancing days, but in my 20s, I thought I was going to be dancing forever. And pretty much, I think I spent a good part of my decade wearing nothing but tight, revealing clothes and stilettos. Pretty much. Everywhere I went, whether I was walking the dog or going to the grocery store, uh, I was the kind of person that everybody would, when they were talking to me, be like, what do you do for a living? Are you a stripper? Like, <laughs> he just yes. always had a full face, always had a full face of makeup. And that made me laugh because I was the exact same way. So, like, even though in this it seems really funny and kind of a caricature, when you're an exotic dancer full time, it becomes such a part of your personality that you never leave the house unless you are, you know, dressed up like you're getting ready to go club. You always have on a full face of makeup, false lashes, I mean, and always wearing high heels. And I just thought that was funny that they really embodied that. There's even a scene in the movie where she goes to jail and six months in jail, six months later she comes out and the day she comes out, she's wearing tight, revealing clothing and a full face of makeup. Yes, I know. <laughs> prison couldn't, even prison couldn't keep her from wearing makeup. It's, <laughs> so, well, I mean, it's, it's, it's once you realize this is definitely a comedy and not an official sequel, it's, uh, you can definitely get some laughs out of this. There's a lot of just crazy screwball stuff in this. Um, I really enjoy that there's a lot of dancing, a lot lot of exotic dancing and like there's some serious dancing but for the most part it's spoof dancing so like the very beginning of the movie there's a ton of crotch shots i mean she has on pantyhose and panties but i mean it's it's so weird because it's like it's just like you can't look anywhere else it's like she spreads her legs open and you're just like whoa Right in the beginning of the movie, I'm seeing lap dancing and I'm seeing crotch shots and I just, uh, there's a, a, pretty much she uh, lap dances wherever she goes. <laughs> well, it, it's, I, I think the other thing too is that, you know, if, if you're going to continue the story of, um, well, at least continue the story of one of the characters um, from Show Dreams, mm-hmm. um, you, mm-hmm. you, you can't really make a movie about this topic 
without having nudity in the movie. I mean, it, it's oh yeah, uh, oh, yeah. It, it, it's oh, sort yeah. it sort of is essential, you know. I I, I think oh, yeah. it, you know it, it, in a way, um, and uh, I, I I did like too the way that um, that um, Rena sort of just was sort of she was quite free and, and open with all of that, you know. So it's a bit little bit like well, this is what the movie's about, so deal with it, you know. There's going to be you know lots of nudity in it. Um, the but it, it it is as you say it is a parody, uh, you know, in a oh, sense. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there are lots and lots of dialogue in this, which is just pure comedy. Um, oh yeah. Um, there, as you said, there are so many lines which are almost taken directly from the original. Um, basically, yes. yeah, not not ripping the original off, but actually, in, it's sort of like in honour um, of the original. Uh, so it, it's it's. Um, it is. It's weird in a way. I, I, I've seen a number of people who have reviewed this, and I think one of the problems people have with this film is they take it as a, a serious seriously. sequel yeah. to Showgirls, mm-hmm. and, and and the the problem was that Showgirls was a big budget movie with, let's face it, a lot of bad writing and a lot of bad acting. Um, the, but right. it's, but it's still obviously gone on to be a huge cult classic. The thing about this one is that you will look at it, and if you're coming from a serious point of view, you're going to say, oh, God, the writing's terrible, the acting's appalling. But it's not, it, because it's trying to pay tribute to what the original movie was like. Um, you know, they're, they're yes. speaking the way that they did in that original movie. And if you watch the original, <laughs> you watch the original show, Girls, there was... You you listen to Elizabeth Berkeley's dialogue. It is so fake, um, you know. And um, you know, and, and Elizabeth Berkeley, obviously, you know, she's a great actress. I mean, you watch your other films; she's mm-hmm. fantastic. But right, but right. the thing was, it was so overdone, you know, in that movie. And so I like the way in this one that they're tongue in cheek, playing with that, you know. And, and I think it it works. But th- that's the thing; you've got to come into this movie with an open mind. Looking at it as a parody, don't come into it looking as if it's a serious sequel. Because if you do that, you're going to do what so many reviewers have done, and they've shit-canned it. And it's not fair, right. because that's not what this movie is about. You know, they, right. they, I don't think they've understood what this movie, uh, you know, was yeah, about. Yeah, no, like I said, like, if you, yeah, definitely. This is definitely a spoof meant to be a comedy and this is not a movie you're supposed to take seriously at all if you take it seriously yeah definitely then but i mean just there's so much ridiculous i mean ridiculous as in funny stuff in here um just some of the dialogue like at one point um you know penny our main character she goes by an alter ego of helga trying to her identity so she's calling herself helga and finally somebody's like Tell me more about you. So she says that um, she had a twin sister, but she died in a bubble bath accident. Yes, a bubble <laughs> bath accident. I know. I'm like, what? <laughs> I loved it. I absolutely loved it. The soundtrack in this movie was really unusual because I think that's also what made this just so screwball and just so funny was, um, okay, stripper, stripper themes. You're thinking of pop music, rock, rock music, maybe rock. This movie is full. The soundtrack is full of opera, classical music. There's verse of this movie. <laughs> I was just like, okay, that's really fun. You don't expect to hear opera and classical music and the Nutcracker in this movie. And even one of the co-stars, uh, the one that plays Katya, her rival dancer, I think she actually has professional battery like professional ballet training because there's a lot of scenes where they're doing like ballet and I'm like, wait, this woman actually has the flexibility and the vocabulary. Uh, she may not be a professional arena, but she's definitely had some ballet training in there and she's using this movie. <laughs> that was a, it's, yeah, well, the, the music, from what I can gather, because this, as we said, this is an independent film. Uh, so mm-hmm. the um, it is shot, obviously, on an extraordinarily tight budget. Um, and oh, one, one of the reasons 30. that... You, you will find that um, the music that is used is a lot of the music is free domain. Mm, there okay. you go. So that's the reason why sometimes you will look at a scene and maybe think, that m- music doesn't really seem quite right, but it was <laughs> it was probably the closest match they could get for zero dollars. Um, and, and that's the reason why, you know, the, 
you have those sort of issues, I suppose, with the soundtrack. And it really comes down to the fact that um, she did the very best that she could with the budget that she had. Um, and mm-hmm. that's, you know, and, and, that, and that is the reason why. I mean, there are some scenes, for instance, when they're meant to be in, um, like, a street cafe. You can clearly see mm-hmm. it's somebody's back garden. You can see the children slide in the background, you know, in the, um, you, you know, which is coming through into the shot. Um, you, you, you know, you can see scenes which are meant to be on the roadside. They're clearly shot in car parks or, um, you know, or, or areas like that. So, you know, you get a lot of that sort of stuff, but that that's all budget. You know, that is that, that's all comes down to, uh, you know, to the budget. But it, it's um, but there are some serious sort of bits in this movie, or at least attempts to, um, you know, make some serious points. I mean, her character is interesting in itself because I think we, we've all come across people, I think, in our lives who have this <laughs> idea of grandeur that they're more capable mm-hmm. than they than they really are, you know? And, and, and Penny's character is very much like that. I mean, I don't think Penny mm-hmm. realises just how dumb she really is, you know? <laughs> Um, uh, Which is, you know, ignorance is bliss. Yes, and, and you know, and, and that is, and that is, that, that, you know, and, and that is, um, that is, that is played with in number of scenes, you know, and and I also love the fact too that she she's not afraid to play with the fact that you know she's not twenty five anymore, you know, and and mm-hmm. and so you know all the time there's these ongoing gags about how old you are, and and we, and we keep getting these counts like thirty one. 32, 35, 38. <laughs> and she's like, 32 is good. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and, and so, you know, I, I, I love the way that that's, you know, that that's played with because the idea, of course, is that, you know, a, a person like Penny in real life might think that she could go off and be a professional dancer, you know, who's meant to be, you know, in her 40s, but really has but with no professional training no it's not going to happen but but she's just so blinded by fame and stuff that she can't grasp yeah. any of this you know she's but there are people like that that like it's kind of like okay you're in your 50s now and you're still talking about how you're going to become a famous that it's kind of like mm, it could still happen <laughs> what happen because a lot of times they're not even working towards that goal but for some reason they have it in their mind that like in Penny's case, okay, I'm in my forties, but I'm gonna, I'm still gonna be a famous dancer. I'm gonna be a star dancer. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's oh, sorry, actually, sorry. We're just gonna take a very quick break. We're gonna oh. come back because we're just losing the line. So just bear with us for one second, everybody. Okay. We're back. Sorry about that. Uh, one of those issues that happens with a podcasting. Um, so are you, are you there? Because I, I, I was losing a lot of what you were saying there, um, oh, Velvet. Yes. Okay. So I'm not quite sure where you were losing me, but I'll just say again, you know, Penny's one of those people that we all know that one person in life that they're in their, you know, later years, maybe in their 40s. 50s or higher and they're still talking about a dream they were chasing in their 20s and 30s but they're not doing anything to actually make that dream happen <laughs> that's right so it's kind of like it's kind of like okay there's nothing wrong with having a dream and, and you know pursuing that dream but you're not actually doing anything to make it happen so penny's talking about how she wants to be a professionally trained dancer but then you know she isn't seeking professional training <laughs> No, and she keeps, you know, she wants, yeah. <laughs> and she keeps trying to sort of get into the industry, if you like, always via the back door. You know, it's like, right. um, you know, like she she falls into, you know, sort of into prostitution and then meets people and then she, you know, or she goes back to stripping and, and, and all this sort of stuff um, rather than, yes, what uh, uh, someone would do is they just go out and they would get professional training and then apply. Um, you know, right. she's always seems to be working through the back door because she sort of uh, feels that she has this, amazing ability that she just doesn't have um the other interesting thing too is that um when she meets up with you know with her new friend is that they spend one evening 
ballet dancing, <laughs> and Penny now <laughs> believes that she's a professional ballet dancer from ballet like, dancer. Yeah, you know, <laughs> she's like, like I have professional training now. I know, you know, from like <laughs> one from one evening of, of dancing, where they actually spend more of the evening having sets in the swimming pool than they actually yes. do dancing. Um, but yes. um, but then that's the fun of it, you know. I mean, that's the thing. This movie is fun, you know. It's uh, you know, it, it it it's not as we said before, not meant to be taken too seriously. But the one thing that I will say about it is, I really do think an hour and forty three minutes is too long. Um, I agree. You know, I, I agree. I think that she really should have cut this down to an hour and a half. Um, I, I agree. Yeah, I, I think it would have worked better. There, There is a lot of things that happen to Penny in her travels that aren't really crucial to the story, um, you know, mm-hmm. of, of, of where she pacing. goes. And also Yeah, some scenes just run way too long. They could be cut down, exactly. You know, and that's, that's, that's the only thing I would say. Also, I would say that the editing... Um, is there's a couple of hiccups. There's a couple of hiccups in the editing because I noticed some repeating, uh, repeated scenes <laughs> that evidently weren't meant to be left in. It's and I was yeah, like, yeah. So, <laughs> so there was the end there. There was there was a little <laughs> bit of an issue with that. I have to admit, but then once again, mm-hmm. you know, as we said, have said many times, this is an independent film, um, right? You know, and 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 I also have to take my hat off to um, uh, you know, to Rina for basically she did this all herself. You know, yeah. I mean, she she produced it, she directed it, she wrote it, and had to star in it, and then had to go through post production doing all the editing. I mean, this was a, right. a pet project of, of hers, and and I have to sort of say, you know, all right, there are a lot of faults, but well done, girl. You know, you did a that was that was really impressive. Yeah, it's a ton of work, huge amount of work. You know, absolutely huge amount of work. Um, so I, I think that's, you know, you've got to take your hats off, you know, uh, for doing that. Um, but it's, um, I, I don't think there's really a huge amount more we can really say about it, to be truthful. But um, um, I was, I have to admit, I was a little surprised at that uh, the stained glass window, <laughs> the stained glass window of uh, Wizard of Oz had Dorothy, the Tin Man, the Scarecrow, you know, all the all the gang from the Wizard of Oz running down the yellow brick road, and there was uh, swastikas in the sky. I was just like, "Whoa, that was weird." Yes, <laughs> but that that was a weird scene altogether. They went to some weird club, and there was definitely a little bit of a neo Nazism that that storyline kind of got dropped and i don't know that was just weird i was like i'm not sure what's going on <laughs> this guy has horns and he's singing a song <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of really screwball stuff in this that you're just like oh, okay i'm not really quite sure what that was there's a lot of uh storylines that start and don't really go anywhere like for a minute she has an, kind of an agent that's trying to put her in a snuff film and that just kind of just never happens would obviously because she would have been killed and the movie would have been over but <laughs> <laughs> yes, Just some weird stuff. <laughs> there is. I, I think that goes back to that whole idea that the movie is a bit too long. That there are scenes that could have been lost. There are some storylines right. that develop that really could have been lost because a storyline starts, but it doesn't really go anywhere, um, right. you know, and then just ends. Uh, so right. maybe that could have been, you know, sort of taken out. Um, I mean, mm-hmm. I know that she had this huge story that she wanted to tell. Um, but mm-hmm. I, I just think it would have worked better, and I think it probably would have gone down better with audiences if there had have been a bit more cutting. Um, mm-hmm. It's just my opinion. Yeah. It, it is definitely one of those films that if you talk to people about, they basically say, we absolutely adore this, you know, because of they get the humour, you know, which is in mm-hmm. this movie. But then there are other mm-hmm. people who say they absolutely hate it because they don't get the humour. They, they don't get what she was trying to achieve. And I think it's like we said before, they view this as a full-on sequel to Showgirls. And they go in and they say, you know, I hate it. But don't go in <laughs> with that viewpoint. It, that's not what this no. movie is, you know. No, um, exactly. You know, and it's, yeah. it, it's fun. 
Yeah, straight up independent film, not meant to be taken seriously. It's definitely just for entertainment. It's got TNA, it's got dancing, it's got uh, humor, it's got screwball storylines. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that means actual uh, murders that happened in this movie, and those are actually rather funny. <laughs> Well, it's, it's, everything in this is funny. I mean, I found myself yeah. laugh. I mean, when when I started watching it, I have to admit, I really didn't quite know how to take it. I didn't know is this just going to be? It took me like half an hour. Yeah, it took me like half an hour to finally be like, okay, this is definitely most definitely a comedy. This is not meant to be taken seriously. Yes, it, it took it took me a while to get the joke, and once I got the joke, me too. Then I started mm-hmm. to actually because I'll be brutally honest. When I started watching, I sort of thought, oh. This is not as good as I thought it was going to be, and you know, and then, and then, as you said, about half an hour in, suddenly it, it's 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 like that light bulb goes off on the top of your head, yes, and you go, yes, "I get yes. it now. I get what she's trying to do now." Um, but I think exactly. the problem is, so many people will sit through the whole two and a bit of hours, and they will say they won't get it, and that's the problem. And, and right. if, you know, so you got to have an open mind, and I think you've got to have a bit of a weird sense of humor you know um yes. yeah if, if, yes. you, if you think that uh two and a half men is the height of comedy you won't get this but no. if you like <laughs> a lot of you know art house humor um if you like um uh, you know sort of wacky kind of crazy humor then you'll start to get the jokes and then you'll start to laugh and and then you'll start to find oh i'm actually enjoying this you know um Mm -hmm. so yeah that's that's just what i would say yeah it also helps if you're actually familiar with showgirls which i have to admit I'm not that familiar with it. I've seen bits and pieces of it. I'm honestly not that fluent in Showgirls, the original, but I know I know enough of it to notice what scenes were being spoofed and what was being like, <laughs> what was being referenced and stuff. So, I mean, if you're familiar with the original Showgirls, that will definitely help with your enjoyment of this movie because you'll be like, oh, look, it's that dance routine or, oh, my God, look, it's that sex scene in the pool and stuff like that. And also you'll be like, oh, my God, this is Penny from Showgirls, like... Yes, like and and the, mm-hmm. yeah, and uh, yeah, it, it's like you know, I, I would I would say to anyone if you haven't seen the original Showgirls for what <laughs> eighteen years or whatever it was uh, when it first came out, um, then you need to watch it before you watch this because, as you said, Velvet, you won't get the jokes, you won't get the writing, right. you won't get right. a lot of the things that they're talking about because you'll just look at it and say. Well, guys, that's not funny. I don't get. And then, but if you, <laughs> but if you remember what happens in show deals, if you remember what the acting was actually like in show deals, if you remember what the dialogue was like, <laughs> and then you watch this, then you will say, as I said before, now I get it. Now I get what she was, you know, what she was trying to do. Um, but, uh, but, but in saying that, I, I think that she still was trying to put some serious stuff into this. But I, I think in some ways, a lot of people don't see that either because they get caught up in the humour and they lose some of the seriousness stuff, you know, which mm-hmm. which he's trying to put in. So um, it's it, it it look it's got its issues. Uh, there's no doubt it's it's got its issues. But you know what? I still enjoyed it. I still enjoyed it. Just wish it was a little bit shorter. Yeah, I have to agree. I, I actually had to take a break on this one. About an hour and a half in, I was finally like, I have to take a break. I can't sit for two and a half hours at this moment. Not that I can't watch a two and a half hour movie, but it was one of those days where I was just like, I didn't time it right. And I'm like, oh, I have stuff I have to do right now. I can't sit here and watch a movie for two and a half hours. So an hour and a half in, I had to take a break, and then I had to come back later to watch the rest of it. And I was just like, yeah, this is a bit long. <laughs> <laughs> and, but the other thing, too, we should say is that um, Rena Riffle, who, of course, basically did everything in regards to this movie, mm-hmm. um, she mm-hmm. is gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. Yes. Um, you oh, will, my God. Her body's amazing. And you, oh will, and you will see a lot of her body in this movie. Yes. But the other thing, too, <laughs> is that one thing that you will be astounded by is if you watch this as a double feature with the original Showgirls, she's hardly aged. She doesn't really look like she's eighteen years older. Wow. Um, I, w- I was stunned at just how similar. Like she obviously has a very good health regime because she doesn't seem to have aged. It, it's quite astounding. Yeah. 
Well, look at her body. She evidently takes very good care of herself, and good for her because, yeah, she's a, she's a treasure to watch. She's so beautiful in this movie, and she does have dancing ability. I mean, she really hams it up and you know makes a joke out of it, but she evidently has the, the, the talent to dance, which is pretty cool. Yeah, it's fun to watch. Oh, yeah, no, no. I, I think she was great. And uh, I, I know that she's got a, a brand new movie, um, which is um, uh, out, at, I think it's out at the moment or is coming out at the moment, which I think we'll have to have a look at because she is, and I really, I really like her because, um, you know, I'd only really seen a lot of her work in other movies where her roles were quite sort of small. Uh, so this, it, it's really, it was really interesting to see something that she was in as the main star and obviously directing and all the rest of it. And uh, I, I think she did all right, you know, and I, and I think she did all right. And uh, she also lights a lot of my train set photos online too. So <laughs> nice. nice. <laughs> so, uh, no, I mean, uh, you it know. really is impressive that she did. So, I mean, she pretty much did this whole movie herself. I mean, there's other people in the movie, but I mean, yeah, the directing editing, I mean, yes. Yeah. It's a huge undertaking and her budget was only like $30,000. I mean, there are so many movies that have could not even be made for that, and that she made this, you know, basically double feature film well, <laughs> on a budget of thirty thousand. That's 000. right. I mean, amazing. What was? I mean, you think about it. What was the budget? Um, we were just talking about Eyes of the Roshi. Um, mm-hmm. Now, what was the budget on that? Um, that was um, eight hundred, five hundred thousand, eight hundred thousand. I it? forget now. Now, now a million, it, a million. I'm sorry. I <laughs> no, but I mean. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is that they're not really comparable movies, even though they're both independent movies. But this, right. I mean, this movie was made on a shoestring budget. And the fact that she yes. was able to put it all together and get it out there, um, you know, I, that I've just got amazing respect for. And, uh, you know, so, um, oh, no, you know, I liked it. Definitely, it's a movie I'm glad I saw. Uh, it's not one of my I would rather be cleaning the toilet films. So... <laughs> You know, uh, definitely, you know, I liked it. And uh, she's also, you know, made some contact with us online and she's been extremely nice. Uh, so, cool. uh, so you know, yeah, thumbs up. Absolutely thumbs up. So if we are going to rate it, Velvet, which we have to, of course, <laughs> what are we going to okay. do? Well, like I said, um, independent films, not going to be for everyone. Um, it took me a while to realize it was a comedy. So, I mean, that's a, you know, but that's my, that's my own fault, you know, because nowhere on this movie does it says, this is a serious film that you have to watch with an analytical eye. Like, I mean, if I didn't get the joke right away, that's obviously on me and my sense of humor. Um, just slight ed- editing errors, um, runs a bit too long. Uh, the sound mix um, in some parts is a little hard to hear what people are saying. Sometimes their voice blends in with the ambient uh, atmosphere noises. But all in all, if, you, if you're if you a fan of the original Showgirls, then you definitely at least want to watch this one time because that's just going to add to your nostalgia and your pop culture love. So out of a possible five Eric Roberts, I'm going to go ahead and give this a two Eric's out of a possible five. Okay, okay. Well, I'm going to go a little bit higher. Um, I think that, one, I just think the product, for all of its, you know, little faults, the product that you put together on zero dollars, um, you know, I think is kind of outstanding if you look at the end result versus, you know, the amount of money that they had to make it. Uh, so I'm actually going to give it three out of five Eric's. Um, so... Definitely, I think it's a passing grade. And, um, you know, I just always want to support, you know, indie films, uh, you know, when they're out there. And, uh, you know, I, I liked it because I am a huge fan of the original show drills. You know, I've, I've got... I've even got the old VHS copy sitting out in my garage somewhere, you know. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I've got it on DVD. I've got it on Blu-ray. I absolutely, you know, adore that film. And so the fact that, you know, it's just wonderful that this, it not a sequel by any means, but this extension of the story um, was, was made and we got to sort of see you know, what Rena thought the concept of the character Penny from the original movie, um, you know, where her life, you know, would go in 18 years time. And, uh, and I, and I thought it was, it was very well done. And I thought, 
She carried it off well. Humour was great. Um, but, yeah, look, it's still got a 1,001 faults. I, I won't deny that. So, uh, no, <laughs> but I'll give it three Eric's out of five. So, All right. There we go. There we go. So that was Show Drills 2, Pennies from Heaven. Um, oh, now, we also said uh, last week that we've been terrible for not telling people where you can get these movies. Um, now, um, Show, Drills, Pennies, uh, Show Drills 2, Pennies from Heaven is readily available on Amazon, um, whether you want to buy it in disc form or whether you want to buy it in, was it Amazon Prime? So you can actually right. download it. So it's available in both formats. Uh, so it's readily available for people to watch. Um, and, of course, Amazon Prime is now available internationally, so you'll be able to rent it internationally as well. So that's really cool. Yeah. And I, th- I think that's it. So that was, yeah, Show Deals 2, Pennies from Heaven. So we will take a quick break. And if I can find the right uh, button again, this has not been my show, has it, Velvet? It really, technically, <laughs> just, you know. Uh, it's all good. It's, it's all, all good. good. Yeah, we're just here. We just have fun, guys. See, I'm talking through the filler again. We just have fun. Don't take us too seriously. It's all about enjoyment of film. <laughs> Now, movie number, I was going to say movie number three, but it, <laughs> we had Ethan on it, it was movie number two. <laughs> movie number two is from 1973, and it is, look, this really is, when you talk about a cult classic, this really mm-hmm. is a cult classic, um, and it is Enter the Dragon. Um, now, this is a movie that I think a lot of people of a certain age grew up on. I mean, this mm-hmm. is just a, a full-on, you know, cult um, movie. But it's more than just a kung fu movie. I mean, there is a real serious undertone plot to this. Um, you know, it, mm-hmm. it is more than just, you know, hey, let's just bash the shit out of a whole heap of people and save the girl. <laughs> you know, this this movie has actually got a lot more to it. And... Uh, it doesn't necessarily have happy endings or anything either. It's it's actually really quite uh, an amazing film. And uh, so if for anyone who hasn't seen Enter the Dragon, and I'm thinking there'll probably be a lot of young millennials who probably haven't seen this film. Um, mm-hmm. Here's the, the, the brief synopsis. Now, basically, it is set and all filmed in Hong Kong. Uh, it is the story of uh, Bruce Lee, and uh, it was, in fact, Bruce Lee's final movie uh, before he died. And um, he's hired by a... Um, sort of an international intelligence agency. I must admit, the first time I saw this movie, I thought he was hired by the British government. But on re-watching, no, he's not. He is actually just hired by some sort of, I don't know, international group um, to go and infiltrate um, a an island off the coast of Hong Kong, which is being run right. by an evil master, uh, criminal <laughs> sort of uh, criminal overlord. Um, and he is sent off to be part of this Kung Fu or martial arts competition. And while he's there, he's meant to gather information on this criminal person so then they can then hand it across to uh, you know like the british government and people like that who will then have the the information they need to act on it and to possibly you know go after him well when he's there there is it, it it's a huge story i mean it is I, i'm not describing this properly i'm really not but we have several. We have several other characters. We have John Saxon and Jim mm. Kelly, uh, who also yes. uh, will go along as fighters uh, in this competition, and they are all meant to basically fight it out to see who is the best martial arts person. But at the right. same time, we've got Bruce Lee working undercover as a secret agent, almost trying to <laughs> gather information, uh, you know, on uh, on their host, and it will all end in one huge, giant martial arts extravaganza <laughs> yeah. with hundreds yeah. of people fighting. Let alone all the other martial fighting that we've or martial arts fighting we've had during the film. 
Oh, that was the worst explanation I've ever given on a film. You know, but, uh, but you, this movie um, has a lot going on because compared to today's action films or even when the you know, the occasional martial arts film comes out, it has a very simple premise. And this film, it's not a complicated premise, but it's a lot more involved than most martial arts films nowadays. And I actually really like the plot line of this movie. I like how they take the main characters and show you a little bit of their background so that you care enough about them and you know how they ended up in the tournament and what their motivations are for being there, which are all, they all have very interesting motivations. Um, I thought it was really interesting that for a movie from 1973, because many people say this is the film that really introduced the United States and honestly the rest of the world to the whole martial arts film genre because um i like that this film also has a woman in it which is supposed to be um bruce lee's sister in the movie uh she's kicking ass she's using martial arts to defend herself and i was like wow this is not just you know a male dominated there's also you know a woman in this movie using martial arts to defend herself which i thought was pretty ahead of the time pretty cool it's yes, and, and it is. It, it's a cross cultural film in a in a sense because it yes. was it was really an American Hong Kong sort of co production. Um, you know, if, yes. if you like. So, because I know a lot of Bruce Lee fans will say that this is not by any means Bruce Lee's best film um, mm-hmm. because they love the true Hong Kong cinema, which he made so many martial arts films. Obviously, right? Um, all in right. Can- all in Cantonese. Where this movie, of course, is a hundred percent in English. Um, and in fact, I believe the Cantonese version of this had to be dubbed, so it was actually yes. filmed and shot in English. Um, well, it's actually filmed and shot with no audio, which is what I thought was interesting. So the people who didn't speak English spoke whatever they spoke, and then Bruce Lee spoke English or you know Cantonese whenever he needed to, and and then once the movie was done shooting, that's when they would actually dub in the corresponding languages, which I thought was interesting. Oh, that's so actually, fascinating. Yeah. So I was like, oh, that's how they do that. Because at first I was kind of like, well, no, he's definitely speaking English in this part because his lips would line up perfectly. But then the guy next to him, I'm like, okay, now he's obviously had his English dubbed in. I'm like, how did they do this? But yeah. We always do our homework after the movie, and then we're like, oh. Oh, we that's how they. Fun. <laughs> yeah. That's, <laughs> that's how they do fun, it. Interesting facts. <laughs> so, but the, um, yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say, but the other interesting thing, too, is that the two Western characters, because obviously everybody, well, not everybody, there are a number of Western characters uh, in this. Um, the sort of uh, secretary and the bodyguard to the um, uh, our main villain, uh, Western, um, the mm-hmm. or, and also the two two of the fighters who go um, are Western. Uh, but apart from them, everybody else in this movie is Chinese. Um, yes. It is a full-on Chinese cast. And, in fact, um, yes. even the producers of this movie are, are all, a number of them are all Chinese. So this was a real mixture, you know, movie. Um, I suppose a little bit like if you remember the movie Tora, 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 um, which is, although it's seen as a Hollywood film, it's, in fact, as much Japanese as it is American. Um, you know, so it, it is very much, a you know, a, a cross-national production um but it, it's interesting that um the two uh, westerners who were meant to be the fighters uh john satson mm-hmm. and, and jim kelly were martial mm-hmm. arts fighters themselves um, yes yes yeah they john were Saxon was yeah. actually a bat, black belt in karate and um jim kelly was actually the i believe he was the uh, the world or he was the what was he he was the united states karate champion i believe at the time with all the tournaments and stuff i believe he was actually like the actual champion of karate at the time this movie was made at least in the United States. Yes, yeah, so they didn't just cast two actors and then have to film around them, you know, with stunt doubles. They actually had actors right. who could do their own their own stunts. So that was – because let's face it, in Hong Kong, uh, well, now it's a little bit different. We have CGI and all sorts of different things. But, you know, back then, right. basically, you did your own stunts, you know. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so yeah. it was it – was, it, that is a really good thing about it. But the other thing, too, is that this movie is seen as so crucial – in, in, uh, to film history that in 2004, mm-hmm. now we've spoken about the National Film Registry in Washington, uh, where every right. year they lay down a movie for preservation. And in 2004, mm-hmm. this movie was added to the collection. 
Yeah, so, yeah, they're like, this definitely needs to be preserved. Yes. <laughs> Which I'm glad they do that because uh, we take it for granted now that there's so many digital and physical copies available of films, but there have actually been films that have been lost in time or bits and pieces of films have been lost in time that can never be recovered because people didn't preserve them. You know, they didn't have the mass copying, you know, sciences and technologies that we have now, like Metropolis, one of my favorite classic films. I mean, they're, they, they're still doing what they can to restore that motherfucker because yes. the original was not very well taken care of. And every now and then, like every 10 years, they're like, oh, we found another frame in a, somebody's shoebox in an attic. <laughs> it's like, let's add it in. So, yes. Oh, it happens with a so lot of <laughs> a lot of old TV shows that happens too as well. Yes. You know, yes. uh, they, like they, there's Doctor yeah. Who episodes that we'll never see because they weren't saved, they weren't preserved. I mean, it's pretty fascinating. Oh, yeah. But, uh, now. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, a, 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 absolutely. <laughs> but the, uh, that was just a bit of an awkward <laughs> thing. But the, uh, um, but the other thing too is that this movie was a huge financial success. Um, I think mm-hmm. it cost them at the time 850000 US dollars to make. Now, in yes. the US alone, so this is not taking into account Hong Kong and then all of the, you know, other nations where it would screen. Um, the return was $21.5 million. Wow. So and worldwide it's been ninety million worldwide. So yeah, that's a humongous profit on this film. So, so ve- pretty really, yeah, really, really highly, you know, successful. And um of course it was not the first time that, you know, Bruce Lee would be seen on um or, or was seen on Western screens. I mean, Bruce Lee, of course, was in the original TV series The Green Hornet. Um, and, right. Uh, with uh, the character was it Kato? I think the character is that Kato. right? Kato. Yeah. And mm-hmm. uh, and of yeah. course, you know, and it's the other thing too about this movie is that it has been parodied so much. I mean, it and- is a humongous part of pop culture. Even if you've never seen the film, you know you've seen something from the film pop culture references and spoofs. Oh, yes. I mean, go and watch uh, a comedy that was released a few years ago called Balls of Fury. Now, that was just a total (laughs) comedy send-up of this movie. They just replaced the martial arts with ping pong. But otherwise, <laughs> the movie is it is copied, you know, uh, totally. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but also, even, even, I'm even, sorry, but even walking. <laughs> but uh, he was great, wasn't he? He was great in that, yeah. Mr. Walker. Oh, he played that. He played that so well because you think he's meant to be so nasty, but he's such a. He, oh, it's so good. Oh, he's a funny guy. Oh, a funny guy. He, he does comedy well. I've got to. He really yes, does. Um, yes. But um, but the other thing too, even Blake. Edwards in all of the Pink Panther movies would copy and send up this, you know, and the Pink (laughs) Panther movies were huge blockbusters, but here they Mm. are continually parodying Enter the Dragon, Uh, you know, so (laughs) it's, um, I mean, you know, so it's, it's, and also just Bruce Lee himself. I mean, the fact that, you know, Inspector Clouseau's manservant was called Cato and that they were always (laughs) fighting each other, you know, in these martial arts uh, things. So um, it's, you know, it it is amazing. You know, this movie has written itself into cult cult culture without any doubt. Now, one thing I was going to ask you about um, um, Velvet is that I did did find what was really interesting was the adding of um you know the movement that was around in the late 60s and into the 70s the black power movement in the united states mm, and yeah. that is clearly expressed um in this movie yes and you know i think that's really interesting that they did that too because i mean bruce lee himself you know an immigrant from china spoke with an accent People and, you know, Hollywood telling him, oh, well, we can't ask you for this show because you look too Asian. <laughs> you know? yeah. So he was obviously, uh, un- you know, he would obviously experienced racism and prejudice and people just not, you know, giving him a chance to show his true character based on his ethnicity and appearance. And I think he could obviously identify with the African-Americans. And so that storyline is, you know, very lightly included in this film. But then they're all obviously fighting as equals because they're in a, the same tournament and they're, you know, they're using the same skills of martial arts to, you know, fight survival. And just, I thought that was really cool that that was in here. But also, I mean, again, um, they have the the character that's supposed to play his sister in this movie. She's also doing martial arts and she's defending herself. So there's, there's a lot of um, equal rights 
throughout this whole movie because I mean he's also trying to bring down you know a sex trafficking ring because you know these yes. women should have the right to choose <laughs> well, that, who that's... they're having sex with and if they're having sex and you know it's it's amazing it's a really great movie it is and and also you know our other two uh, martial arts people is that you know they they are meant to be sort of semi criminals um, but mm-hmm. when, but when they arrive you know we find out that. Well, there are certain limits, though. There's crime, and then there's mm-hmm. crime. Um, you know, it's right. a little bit, a mm-hmm. bit of a, like a gambling ring or something like that. That's okay, yeah. but sex trafficking? No way. We're not going right. to, you know. And so right. they will then, of course, you know, join with with Bruce Lee in trying to take down, um, you know, this, this, this evil guy who was played by um, was it uh, Shia King? I think is. I, not exactly sure how he pronounced uh, how the name. Yeah, is I'm not trying to pronounce the name either. I have to admit. Yeah, yeah I'm just going to say Shiki, and I'm going to say the way you said it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but of course he's 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 wonderful because of course he's he's meant to only have the one hand, and so he keeps yes. putting on the interchangeable hands, <laughs> and. Uh, and of course, he will in one fight scene put on the um, like the giant claw hand, and uh, mm-hmm. and this is something once again that will be done to death in you know in in, yeah. in other movies. But very it would, iconic, and it, yes. yes, and it would bring up that huge iconic scene, of course, or photograph of Bruce Lee with the razor cuts on, well, obviously yes. fate, but the fake razor <laughs> cuts, um, you know, on his body, and that image of Bruce Lee has has written itself into history you know absolutely extremely iconic scene um yeah the whole hall of mirrors i don't want to uh, play it up too much because it's one of those things that if you talk about too much and somebody sees it then they feel let down because you hyped it up too much but it really is one of those scenes it's it's just amazing imagery um uh, when i was reading up on trivia on when they did the hall of mirrors the final fight scene in this movie they said they actually used eight thousand mirrors to create that and i'm like what wow <laughs> i can't even count that high i'm like how in the hell i mean i don't know if that's an exaggeration at this point but that that was the st- that was the fact i coming across was eight thousand mirrors and i'm like really so you definitely need to see this because it's uh definitely the whole thing of you know bruce lee's fighting the bad guy but there's all these mirrors so it's kind of like what's the reflection what's really the real person where's he coming from where's he at and and so at first you think bruce lee might kind of bite it because he's getting injured and (laughs) it's just yeah it's 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 a really cool scene Oh, and, 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 and I was also just going to say the cinemato- cinematography in this movie is magnificent. Oh, it's um, really nice. Isn't it is, it? A, yes. especially the. I mean, the indoor shots are pretty much like any movie you would expect from the nineteen seventies. To be truthful, but the exterior mm-hmm. shots are magnificent. They are really, really well done. Um, yeah, a- 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 absolutely <laughs> great. There's a really cool fight scene between Williams and Han, and Williams is the African-American uh, character. Oh, and I just have to say, you know, I'm not usually a fan of the Afro, but Williams really rocked the Afro in this movie. Oh, he Loved carries the it well. on him in this movie. I thought it looked really smooth on him. Like, yeah. well done. But anyways, Williams and Han, so the bad guy, there's a scene where they're actually fighting, and the camera angles in this are just amazing. And, like, at one point, like, while they're fighting, all of a sudden birds are coming in. Yes. Like all of a sudden there's birds and then all of a sudden there's like use of the mirror they keep using a mirror to show like bad guys are coming and he's got to fight them and then at one point there's like a silhouette and they break through the wall so now on top of that they have a location change to go with this fight so I mean like there's a lot going on and I was like wow this is really good cinematography for the time they also did a lot of uh, point of view shots where like the camera you, it would be like if somebody was going to punch you or kick you and it would like have the camera in that frame of view like you were the one actually being attacked and uh, and the overall fight choreography is quite good. Um, Bruce Lee choreographed all the fight scenes in this movie, and there is a lot of fighting. And there's even um, Jackie Chan, if you're a Jackie Chan fan. He's actually in this movie, you know, one of his very first movies. Um, so if you're looking for him when you're watching the movie, whenever um, Bruce Lee's sister is being bullied, Jackie Chan is the one that hugs her and she knees him in the balls. And then he shows up again um, in, like, this cave and Bruce Lee grabs him by the hair and, you know, soon defeats him. But, yeah, Jackie Chan's in this movie. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's got everything. And, in fact, one of the producers who, of course, 
I, I think it was very good friends of Jackie Chan is, is it Raymond Chow? Uh, and he was, of okay. course, one of the producers. Uh, and, this, and in fact, I think we actually see Raymond Chow in one of the very early fight scenes. Um, you know, oh, when cool. they're fighting in the... Um, uh, you, you know, in their monastery at the very, very start. Mm-hmm. And you know this like, yes, chubbier yes. guy who's fighting? Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, yeah that's, that that's... was actually Bruce Lee's actual sparring partner. Yes, that's him. Yes. But, I, that, but that's Raymond Chow, though, isn't it? I think. Yes, I believe that's his name. I'm yeah. pretty sure that's Raymond Chow. Yeah, and, that's um, a... Yeah. Uh, because I remember there's, there's a cafe in Melbourne and, uh, I used to go and, uh, eat there all the time. It's what we call like a Vietnamese tea house. Um, so they serve, you know, fur and broken rice. It's, it's like, uh, you know, there's only about three things on the menu. You know, you just walk in, they're laminates <laughs> tables. And, and I used to go there for lunch all the time. And, uh, but it's in the, the central business district of Melbourne. And it was when Jackie Chan was here with Raymond Chow filming a movie one of their movies. Oh, wow. And it was always really That's cool because cool. you could get to sit there and all around the um, the walls of this place were photographs of Jackie Chan and Raymond Chow having lunch. Um, they, <laughs> That's they, cool. They'd blown them all up and framed them and put them all over the walls of this little cafe. Um, so, um, yeah, so it's, yeah, fantastic because like, I'm a huge fan of, of, of Jackie Chan, you know, yeah, and, like and, and, uh, and the concept that he was actually in this movie, you know, a lot of people don't I know, know that. know. Like, he actually got to fucking fight and spar with Bruce Lee. I mean, that's every martial artist's dream, I think, and that he actually got to do that's really, like, wow. <laughs> but the, that's so amazing. Oh, I know. But the one thing we should say, uh, though, to everybody is that um, this is not like... If you're used to Jackie Chan movies, this is mm-hmm. not like Jackie Chan. This is Bruce no. Lee movies and also the martial arts movies from Hong Kong through the 1970s were not what you would expect today. They're quite different. Right. They don't have mm-hmm. the humour that the modern ones have. Um, right. Like you watch a Jackie Chan movie and the fight scenes are almost like a ballet. Um, you know, this is actual real mm-hmm. fighting. You know, this is martial yes. arts uh, taken very seriously where Jackie Chan would turn all of that on its head and he would, you know, turn martial arts films into exciting adventure sort of films. Yes. They wouldn't be about the fighting anymore. They'd be more about the stunts. Um, so, um, but this is more that tradition, you know, of Hong Kong cinema. Um, you know, so what, what was the old line? You know, you've got to have um, three things in a Hong Kong movie, police, ghosts, or martial arts. As long as you've got one <laughs> of the three in them, you're going to have a hit, you know. Um, and this one does not let down on the martial arts. There is so much fighting in this. And yeah. it's, and, and, and this movie good. is aged really nicely. Yeah, this movie's aged really nicely too, actually, because it's from 1973. And even though it's obviously got some of the 1970s three fashion, the um, just the overall scenery, just the, the themes of the film. I mean, this is really well aged. Um, it's almost it's really almost timeless if you don't pay attention to the fashion and the hairdos. Yes, <laughs> and um, um, just uh, even yeah, I just. Oh, the scenery. Oh, my God. They made such good use of the scenery in this movie because it was definitely shot in China. And I mean, like you get to see the boats and they really wanted to introduce like the rest of the world to, you know, Chinese culture. So you see like just like the the type of clothes they're wearing, the music, the dance. Uh, It's just I really enjoy watching this movie, not even just for the fighting, but just how they show the whole scenery and just. And the people in this movie are really quite attractive, male and female, for the most part. Not everybody, obviously. <laughs> and um, it just, this is definitely worth checking out if you've never seen it. Even if you're not into martial arts, you want to see this one at least once so you can get all the pop culture references and you'll be in the know. <laughs> oh, yes. And, and the other thing, too, what's different about this as well is that it's got some nudity in it, um, which it does. Which is, it does. is which obviously for 1973 in Western films was almost kind of normal. Um, but Hong Kong films in 1973, well, okay, if you were making what they call a Cat Three or Category Three film in Hong Kong, of course there'd be <laughs> lots of lots of you know we all remember erotic ghost story and uh, you know and all these um, what was it Amy Yip you know and, and all these these uh, actresses you know from uh, uh, you know. Su Chi and other people, you know, from Hong Kong. But but the thing is that 
if you were to watch a martial arts movie in Hong Kong, you weren't going to get that. So this was actually quite different, you know, in, in the fact that they did that. They were quite brave. Um, it's um, But the other thing, too, I, I was going to point out is we, we spoke about the mirrors, or you brought up mm-hmm. the mirrors. And, um, of course, the reason mm-hmm. um, for that is that one of the final fights in this is, as Velvet was saying, is in this big room full of mirrors. But what's very interesting is that, it's almost identical in many ways to a fight scene at the end of a James Bond movie called The Man with the Golden Gun, which was also mm. surprisingly filmed in, much of it filmed in Hong Kong, although mm. a lot of it was filmed in Thailand as well. But it's interesting how the scenes are very, very similar. And, uh, you know, this concept of did one copy the other? Well, I don't know. You can be the judge of that because Enter the Dragon was from 1973 and Man with the Golden Gun was from 1974. So I don't really know they would have had time or the ability to have seen each other's product before they'd actually written the scripts. Uh, so I think it's just coincidence more than anything else. Yeah, that's so odd. That's really, really strange. And But, you know, some people say that um, Enter the Dragon is like a James Bond movie with martial arts <laughs> because well, it you, know, you got a spy you got sexy women you got yeah instead of guns you got martial arts i mean <laughs> it, no it, it, it really is and in fact there yeah. are a lot of similarities actually with this movie uh to dr no the very original um you know sort of james bond film uh and, and i i do think that they there, there is a bit in this which has been taken from james bond it's not it's mm-hmm. not stolen by any means but mm-hmm. i think I think Bond movies would have influenced this. There's no doubt in that. You that know? makes sense. Yeah, yeah definitely. There, there, there's, there's no um, doubt in that. Uh, I love how they do set up very early in the movie that there will be no guns on this island. So, you know, they can't just go in there and shoot the bad guys. Like, you do have to be versed in <laughs> in uh, martial arts in order to defend yourself. And you have to watch the movie to see how they pull that off. I thought it was actually well done. But it is really a treat to watch Bruce Lee. Oh, my goodness. Because he's one of those people. First off, he's really expressive. When he does his martial arts, so he gives you that whole satisfaction of, you know, the whole, yay, rah, rah, instead of being stone-faced and, you know, making no noise. Like, he's very expressive. Oh, he is, but, yeah. You know, yeah, and, but at the same time, he is so smooth. Like, he makes karate, or excuse me, he makes his martial art look so effortless, and you're just like, wow, he makes this look so easy. <laughs> <laughs> but you know he it's does, not. yeah. You know, yeah, you know it's not. And at the same time, his character in this movie, I thought was really likable because he's really smooth and confident, and just yeah, yeah just mm, really enjoy this movie. It's just it's really fun to watch. And, I the, think other, it's really and fun. the other thing too is the message which is put out with this, and that is that the bad guy on the island has come from the same monastery as um, as Bruce mm. Lee. But he's gone mm-hmm. bad, right? He's gone bad. He's become an evil yes. criminal. And the interesting thing, yes. too, about this is that all the way through this movie, the point is continually pushed that martial arts are not taught for violence. Martial right. arts, that's not what it's about. You know, yes, mm-hmm. it could be used for violence, um, and yes, right. you can do competitive fighting and all this sort of stuff, but mm-hmm. that's a sport. Mm-hmm. It's not, right. you know, um, and, and and in fact, in one scene, he actually begs forgiveness for what he's about to do, mm-hmm. for, the, for the fact that exactly. he's actually going to have to kill people, and he actually right. asks forgiveness before he does it. So there's a very yes. interesting message in that, you know, from... Uh, you know, the whole culture of martial arts, you know, and I, I think anyone that, that does martial arts will understand that. I, I think a lot of us yes. don't have anything to do with it. Just think, oh, it's a form of fighting. No, it's it's actually a lifestyle. Mm. You know, it, it's more, right. than, you know, a, a, a absolutely, you know, a lot more than that. Um, the other interesting thing, too, is we keep talking about China, you know, all the time. Mm-hmm. But of course, in mm-hmm. 1973, when this was made, it was not China. Oh, this is huge. Um, oh, yeah, it, this yeah is it was, huge. of course, part of Britain. Um, you know, Hong yes. Kong was a British territory. And um, right. and that's it, the interesting thing that, you know, when we look at the um, uh, the man who sends Bruce Lee there, he's British. You know, he's yes. not, he's not yes. Chinese. Yes. Um, and, mm-hmm. uh, and the other thing too, all the shots of Hong Kong Harbour and all the rest of it, um, you can see the British and American warships all in the harbour, you know, which of course wow. today you're not going to see that. Um and uh, and and of course it also plays because this is pre 
modern Hong Kong airport. This is when they still had the old airport, you know, where the planes used to come across at rooftop level across the city, you know, before they landed on the, um, you know, on, oh, Hong, on, on Hong Kong, um, you know, airport. And of course, it was always said, you know, it's like you could just stand in Hong Kong and just watch these things come across and you thought they were going to hit the buildings. And it was just every day, you know. <laughs> oh, gosh, that's terrible. You know, and, and we um, get to see all of that. Yeah, I mean, John Saxon, some people complain he's in this movie too much. But I mean, honestly, at the time when people were making this movie, they're like, yeah, this is be bruce lee's movie but we're not sure how well it's going to do so we got to make sure we have a central white character in it which unfortunately that was just the mentality of the time but i do like uh john saxon's character in this i i like that he's just kind of this you know womanizing gambler that actually has a black belt in karate because he ends up being a good guy in the end you know like he yeah he you know he's in debt for gambling and he's probably not the best person but at the same time he saves a cat from getting guillotined. Come on, yeah. he's a good guy. <laughs> well, well, that's the thing. When he's <laughs> he's offered to go into into partnership to be yeah. to be you know uh, to be part of this drug and sex trade, and he refuses. Mm. He flatly den- yeah. refuses to to go into business with them. But you know, as he said, there are um, you know there are some things that he won't do, and uh, so he does turn out to be a good person. Um, it's just mm-hmm. that yeah, he's, he's a criminal, but. He's not a violent, bad criminal. He doesn't hurt people. He doesn't kill people, you know. And, and, yeah. and so, um, yes, you know, he's a gambler and, and, and all this sort of stuff. It was interesting, too, to see the bat story of um, the uh, of those two characters. Um, obviously, mm-hmm. you're talking about John Satson, but also Jim Kelly, that they were meant to be its war buddies. Um, yeah, that's yeah, how they yeah. met. So they knew each other, so they were friends. Yeah, I, mean, I really like the way they did backstories on the main characters in this movie. They gave you enough so you did care about them. You know, instead of it just being, okay, here's 50 guys and they're all competing and the only one we care about is Bruce Lee. Because then the movie becomes a bit flat and then it's like, well, what's the point of having any of these people in the movie? What do I care if they get killed? I mean, obviously, other than they're fellow human beings, but I mean, for the sake of <laughs> making a movie interesting, we need some character depth. And they did a pretty good job on that, I thought. Oh, and, and, and I think um, also this movie, in much the same light as many of the movies that Jackie Chan would go on to make um, in America, uh, is that they would open up audiences to all the, well, what we would now call Chinese work, but obviously what was then Hong mm-hmm. Kong work, would open it up mm-hmm. to a brand new audience. I mean, after yeah. this movie was released, suddenly people thought, well, who's this Bruce Lee guy? And and they yeah. would go and they would find all of these other movies because he made tons of movies, obviously, in Hong Kong. Um, and yeah. so they would go and track these down. And it's the same with mm-hmm. Bruce, uh, sorry, with, with Jackie Chan. When he started mm-hmm. making Western movies, um, yes. suddenly all these people sort of said, well, what else has he done? And they would go and hunt down this back catalogue of work. Yes, you know, yes, yes. And, and suddenly find all these amazing films that just didn't get mm-hmm. appreciated in the West. So, you know, men yeah. like Bruce Lee and and, and Jack and well, we met, obviously we're talking about Jet Chan, but you know, in this case Bruce Lee, um, they would mm-hmm. open the West up to Chinese culture. Um, Absolutely. You know, which was Absolutely. so great. You know, that was that was wonderful, I thought. It's really a shame that Bruce Lee didn't get the chance to see the legacy that just one film itself left behind and open the world that it opened up for those that don't know bruce lee did pass away before this right before this film was released so he died uh at the prime of his age i think he was only like 30 in his early 30s he was young he was young yeah yeah, very young it was very un you know very (laughs) very nobody saw it coming and it's just one of those sad things, but it's a shame he didn't get to see this legacy. It's well, it's like they call it the curse, don't they? Because of course his son, yeah, um, mm-hmm. you know, uh, the, the fact that Brandon Lee, Brandon Lee passed was, away you know, <laughs> during at, the making of the Crow. Yeah, and yeah, just it, it's guys. yes, the, the the curse of the Lees. You know, it's it's like the, yeah. the, the 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 son dies at this early age. You know, but um, yeah, I'm a fan of conspiracy theories. I love hearing about them. But according to Bruce Lee's wife. She really believes it was a case of water on the brain caused by an allergic reaction to some painkillers that Bruce Lee was taking. So I'm going to respect her and say, I guess that's what happened. (laughs) Well, yes. There are a lot of theories. There are a lot of theories about 
why he passed away so young. And, and he was like in the prime of his fitness. Well, so I, it is really yeah. baffling, baffling. I, I, I think it's, I think it's one of those things that when someone is taken so young, who was mm-hmm. doing such, who was, who was some, somebody of the world. Amazing uh, work. Yeah, that the, the world was with either loved or was starting mm-hmm. to love. Um, yes. the, the problem is we can't accept it. it, it it's like it's mm-hmm. like if we have a death in the family, okay? I yeah. mean, I, I mm-hmm. talk about this from personal experience. I mean, when, when, mm-hmm. when you lose somebody who is so close to you, such a part of your life, you can't accept it. You, you've got to find a reason for why it's happened. You just can't accept that that's just the way of the universe, you know? Right. Um, and, and, yeah, and, totally. And, and so I think that's why when these sorts of things happen, we have to try to come up with some weird conspiracy theory to try to justify it rather than, right. un- unfortunately, mm-hmm. this is just life. Part of life is death, right. you know? Um, so, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a film that came out after this that they try to call it a Bruce Lee film, and it actually has scenes of his funeral, and a lot of people will straight up tell you, do not watch this movie. It is not a Bruce Lee movie. And I'm just like, wow, that's a really scandalous way to capitalize on death. Oh, like, yeah, wow. that's been, that's been <laughs> so done we're, with We won't be covering before. that movie here, but no. I just want to give people a heads up if you hear about it. I recommend you avoid it, but it's your choice. <laughs> <laughs> but one, but one other thing too is that because of Bruce Lee's fame, um, it, if you were to hop onto iTunes or hop onto Netflix or something like that right now, you will find mm-hmm. a ton of his actual Hong Kong Chinese films. So yes. you know, um, yes. now uh, so there is a ton of them out there. Uh, it's mm-hmm. just that they were, of course, all made before this. So, right. um, but they're out there. So if you enjoy this mm-hmm. one. Then go and hunt down the back catalog, you know. Um, yeah, and you'll get I, to see him in his native language with subtitles, or you'll you can find the ones that are dubbed in English. <laughs> yes, there are a lot of dubbed <laughs> for ones. Language you pre- <laughs> for what language you prefer, you might be able to find it. <laughs> so. and, 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 and I would say the same thing with you know Jackie Chan. If you saw all those American mm. movies, was it Shanghai Nights and all this, and you sort of thought, yes. this guy is kind of cool. Well, I'll tell you what, if you go and check out his his Chinese back catalog. You will be blown away because if you think the stunts he did in those American movies are amazing, you want to see what he did in Hong Kong where there was zero health and safety because some of the stunts <laughs> he does jumping from air, from helicopters and landing on top of balloons, <laughs> having fight, having fights on the top of 30 story skyscrapers. Oh. In oh down, my you know, God. I mean, it's some so of dangerous. this, oh, the <laughs> stuff this guy, you know, did was just amazing. And, and, and the thing is that, you know, it's, I, I think there used to be a saying with Jackie Chan, which was a lot of people say, um, the story doesn't make any sense. Why the fuck did that just happen? That wasn't part of the story. And, and apparently <laughs> that Jackie Chan always worked on the premise, don't let the plot get in the way of a good stunt. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah. That makes for great entertainment. Oh, yeah, no, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, a- absolutely. Um, so, yeah, say to anyone, if, if, if you're a fan of Bruce Lee or you're a fan of Jackie Chan, but you've never actually ventured into their native countries' movies, do it. You will not be disappointed. Yeah. You will not yes. be disappointed. Absolutely. Yeah, this film, absolute cult classic. Definitely need to see it at least once because it's such a part of pop culture. Even if you've never seen the movie, you will be surprised how much you're like, oh, that's where that comes from. That comes from this movie. Like, it's it's just such a part of pop culture. Oh, without doubt. Without doubt. So mm-hmm. I think we actually should rate this really quickly because right we are on. so okay. over time. <laughs> um, I cannot no believe how over time we are. Um, so, so okay. Velvet. Okay, on a scale of five Eric Roberts. So this movie is not perfect. Um, some It has aged quite nicely, um, there are some very slight, very small editing things that I noticed. Um, oh, okay, I have to say this really fast because I thought it was funny. There is definitely a scene where he is most definitely kicking, where Bruce Lee is most definitely kicking a puppet instead of kicking Mr. Han, and it makes me laugh every yeah. time I see the scene because the moment he kicks it, it goes across the fucking room so fucking fast that I'm just like, okay, that was definitely not human. Okay, but anyways, just little minor errors like that, but absolute pop culture, cult cultural icon cult classic definitely have to see it so and also because this is such a specific genre and not, i know not everybody can handle martial arts films give this one a try i'm going to give this four out of five eric roberts 
Yeah, I'm going to pretty much be the same. I'm going to say four out of five. I was going to say four out of five jetties. Um, but, um, <laughs> the. <laughs> well, actually, should it be four out of five dragons? Or dragons, <laughs> yes. Um, because, um, no, I, I, I think it's, it's, it's brilliant. I think it's great. Um, it's, it, 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 this movie is very fast paced. You, you, you mm-hmm. won't get bored. And the other thing too is if you're not really hugely into martial arts films, I'd still say give it a try because it's actually yeah. as much a spy drama as it yes, is. Yes. I, mean, I mean, seriously, if you like James Bond films, you're going to like this, mm-hmm. to be truthful. Right. Um, so, Just, you know, replace you know. the guns and gadgets with martial arts. Us, so. Yeah. And, and, and you've got yeah. a very similar film. So, you know, if you're yeah. a fan of Sean Connery's, you know, Bond era, uh, then mm-hmm. you, you'll like this because they are very similar. So, yeah, definitely four. With I'd, I'd even say four and a half. To be truthful, it's, there you it's, go. it's, it's kind of hard to fault it, really. It really yeah. is. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, no, good one. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> well, we, <laughs> re- we really should wrap up. Uh, because, uh, All right. If you're still here at the end of this, thank you for listening for our entire episode. Go ahead and follow us on social media at Instagram and Twitter at Cult Movie Show. You can follow me personally on my Twitter. OMG, it's Velvet. Please be 18 years or older. Follow my co-host, martini super dry at martini super dry on twitter and what else am i forgetting you can listen to us on itunes and youtube and check in next week for more movie reviews and (laughs) we and of course we want to say a huge thank you to ethan martin um we had a guest (laughs) yeah i know i know (laughs) I was about to say, do you know that this podcast has actually run as long as Show Girls 2, Pennies from Heaven? <laughs> yes, thank you, Ethan Martin. You've been a gem. We're so glad we had you on, and we can't wait to talk to you again. And it was, and I also want to say thank you, too, because we had a ball talking. You know, yes. so, so many times people, you know, talk about movies and they have guests on and everything so serious and tell me about in depth, how did your character develop? And it, we just had a great time laughing and joking yes. and talking about stuff. Yes. And he was an absolute <laughs> blast. And I, I want to say thank you so much. That was really cool. Excellent. All yeah. right. So that is basically it. We'll be back again next week with, uh, it almost feels like it's next week now. <laughs> we go so long. Um, we will be back next week with podcast. Oh, fuck. I don't know. Is it podcast 33. 33. I, I, I think at the start of the show, I said it was podcast 31. Do you know? I, I think you I did. actually, oh, I, I thought did it I? was too. I thought it was too until I looked. Yeah. Like, Oops, we're no, on 32. So, so this was in fact podcast 32. Um, so yeah, anyway, um, oh, God, it's been one of those shows shows uh, it's always one of those shows for me i always hit the wrong buttons i'm so professional you know um but anyway um join us again next week for whatever the fuck podcast it is i don't know and, <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh we will leave you as always with the wonderful alana evans and perfect <laughs> Doesn't matter.